the January 26, 2021 Committee on Zoning, Landmarks, and Building Standards is called to order. Pursuant to applicable law, the chairman has determined that an in-person meeting is not practical or prudent. Accordingly, attendance at this meeting will be by remote means only. We will start off with a roll call committee. Members, uh, please unmute yourself. Uh, we'll start with Alderman Hopkins. Will do. Present. Alderman Dowell. Here. Alderman Sawyer. Here. Alderman Beal. Alderman Lopez. Here in my snow boots. Alderman Moore. Alderman Moore, I thought I saw him on there. Alderman Rodriguez. Alderman Cicho Lopez. Present. Alderman Burnett. Alderman Raboyas. Present, Chairman. Rodriguez, present. Mike. Alderman Cardona. Present, Chairman. Alderman Austin. Here. President. Uh, Alderman Viegas. Present. Alderman Wagastan. Here. Alderman Riley. Present. Alderman Kappelman. Present. Alderman Osterman. Present. Alderman Haddon. All right. I, do we have Alderman Beal, are you on? Alderman Beal is here, Mr. Chairman. We got gotcha. you. Anybody else? All right, we have 16, so the quorum is, we do have the quorum. <laughs> All right, I would like to note that discussions are still continuing on document number DOC number 02020-4590, also known as the Clean Air Ordinance, and I'll be holding it in committee till a future date. All right, um, we'll now move on uh, to, to, the, uh, to the approval of the Rule 45 reports containing the minutes of the December 15, 2020 Committee on Zoning, Landmark and Building Standards hearing, as well as the December 15, 2020 Joint Committee hearing with the Committee on Housing and Real Estate. All members of the committee should have received copies of these reports electronically. And if hearing no objections, can I get a motion by the same roll, roll call that was used to determine quorum to approve? Riley so moves. Alderman Riley makes that motion. Any objections? Hearing no objections, these reports have been approved. Uh, Mr. Chairman, point of order. Yes. Do you uh, need a motion to defer on the uh, clean air ordinance or, or is just a simple announcement that you're holding it since it is on the agenda? Yeah, yeah. I'm holding it. We don't, need, we don't need the vote on that. No motion to defer is required. Correct. Okay, thank you. Oh. All right. Um, so now we'll be uh, moving on to the items to be deferred. I'll read the ward, the file number, the address and page number, and we'll take a motion for all at the end. Starting on page six of the revised agenda and page eight of the regular agenda in the, 34, in the 31st ward, file number 20562 for the address commonly known as 3054 through 3058 North Costner. On page nine of the revised agenda and page eight of the regular agenda in the 44th ward, file number 20586 for the address commonly known as 3436 through 3448 North Broadway. On page 13 of the revised agenda and page two of the regular agenda in the third ward, file number 20573 for the address commonly known as 2500 through 2548 South Wabash Avenue. On page 13 of the revised agenda and page two of the regular agenda in the third ward, file number 20585-T1 for the address commonly known as 2601 through 2625 South Wabash Avenue and also 43 through 63 East 26th Street. Also on page 13, the revised agenda and page three of the regular agenda in the seventh ward, file number 20581 
or the address commonly known as 10318 South Torrance Avenue. On page 14 of the revised agenda and page seven of the regular agenda in the 30th Ward, file number 20576 for the address commonly known as 2400 through 2440 North Mead Avenue, also 6100 through 6138 West Fullerton Avenue. On page 14 of the revised agenda and page nine of the regular agenda in the 40th Ward, file number 20574 for the area bounded by West Foster Avenue, North Francisco Avenue, North California Avenue, and West Winona Avenue. Moving on to page 15 of the revised agenda and page nine of the regular agenda, also in the 40th Ward, file number 20575 for the address commonly known as 5200 through 5224 North Washtenaw Avenue, 2700 through 2712 West Foster Avenue, and 2701 through 2711 West Farragut Avenue. And lastly, on page 15 of the revised agenda and page 10 of the regular agenda in the 42nd Ward, file number 20572 for the address commonly known as 523 through 545 South Wabash Avenue, 63 through 69 East Ida B. Wells Drive and 50 through 66 East Harrison Street. If I have no questions by committee members, can I get a motion to defer the previously listed items by the same roll call that was used to determine quorum? Alderman Riley so moves. Alderman Riley moves uh, that motion. Any objections to that? Hearing no objections, these items have been deferred. At this time, we will now begin the public comment period. Out of respect for everyone's time, each speaker is limited to three minutes to address all items on the agenda. This will be the only opportunity to address, to address the items on the agenda, and the committee will not conduct separate public comment periods for each end agenda item. And today we have seven speakers signed up, and we will start. Chairman, if you took roll call, Alderman David Moore is here. For the Thank you, David. We'll add you to the uh, roll call. All right. Our first speaker in the public comment period is Tramel Williams. Greetings, greetings, good morning committee uh, and other members of this council. First off, uh, my name is Tramel Mello Williams of Elite My Management. I wanna say uh, first off, happy 2020. I think this is the first meeting that the uh, committee on um, landmark and zoning is having this year, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and if you guys don't have it on your agenda to discuss today, I wanna put it on your hearts to remember our uh, three initiatives uh, over here, Black Heroes Matters, as I am the chair of entertainment over here. Our initiatives are simply, uh, we wanna honor Chicago's founding father, Jean Baptiste Point du Sable. Uh, specifically with this committee, you guys do have the power, um, as we have been in discussions with a few of the committee members and a few of uh, Mayor Lightfoot's administration, but you guys do have the power to uh, execute on or assist in executing on one of our initiatives, which is the erection of a 25-foot statue or more of Chicago's founding father. Uh, we do know it's a budget deficit. We are well aware of that, as we have been in communication with you guys. But we do want to make sure, as this year starts off in its first quarter, that you guys please, please, those of you who are in favor of our initiative, that you please uh, keep it on your hearts that that is something that does need to be addressed and discussed in this committee committee moving forward for any further meetings. The erection of a major monument for Chicago's founding father, Jean Baptiste Point du Sable. Appreciate the time that you're giving me for public comment this morning, and all I ask that you guys keep that on your heart. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ephraim Martin. Ephraim. To Adam Anthony, um, Tony, and members of the City Council Committee on Zoning, Landmarks, and Building. Good morning. Again, this is Ephraim Martin, President of Martins International, whose objectives include bringing nations together through music and culture, also the chairman of the Black Heroes Matter Coalition, which is calling for the injustices to Jean-Baptiste Point de Sable, Chicago's founding father, to be corrected, and for the outer lecture drive to be renamed the Sab Drive. In addition, we are asking for a full city um, holiday and a major monument for the Saba about which 
we are in discussion with the city administration. Adam and Tony, first, can you tell us where are the Bissaba zone, landmark, and building? We the people are having a Bissaba discriminatory emergency. The Black Heroes Matter Coalition trusts that Aleman Award bookings will, and this coming February Black History Month, call a vote and Council Members Moore and King's ordinance to rename the Outer Lakeshore Drive from Hollywood in the north to 67th Street to the south as the Saba Drive. Mr. Chairman, we are asking all members serving on your committee who are also on the Transportation Committee to vote yes when the order comes up for a vote in the, in the Transportation Committee and for a vote in the full city council. I am almost sure all council members would agree that after 240 years, it is time to show a little love for Chicago's founding father who gave us, for the founding father who gave us Chicago. This man who was a great right, um, uniter, who negotiated settlement between rival ethnic and cultural groups so they could live together as one in this land called Chicago. Chicago must be a land of equal rights and justice, where we all can live together as one people, with no uptown or downtown, but a place where we all can survive together combined as one. The Outer Lakeshore Drive, as the sub Drive, will link the North with the South and serve to unite all of us as one people, which can cultivate a racial restoration of the city and set us on a road toward ending systemic racism in this great city. We thank you all, and we trust that you will help us to make sure we achieve these objectives um, before long as we're in a time limit. Thank you very much. You can visit blackheroesmatter.org um, um, to support our campaign or for more information. Thank you. Our next, thank you. Our next speaker is Paul Colgan. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the Zoning Committee. I am Paul Colgan with the Home Builders Association of Greater Chicago. We oppose ordinances 6206 for the 606 neighborhood and 6207 for the Pilsen neighborhood listed on the addendum to the agenda. These ordinances really don't address affordable housing preservation issues, and instead they limit private property rights of owners to choose a use that is less than the highest zoning allowed. Doesn't this turn a century of Chicago zoning law on its head? Our preference is to focus instead on incentives for owners to retain and improve two, three, or four flat buildings as naturally occurring affordable housing, rather than prohibit new single family dwellings. We prefer to make it economically attractive to keep them as multifamily buildings. That would encourage owners to invest in their properties or sell to new owners who would help, uh, who would work to keep them as multifamily. One example of an incentive would be to include the entirety of both areas under the new ADU ordinances to allow for a lawful way to convert non-conforming or illegal apartments into safe and up to code apartments. This would do more to protect the life, health and safety of any NOAA residents than any anti-demolition ordinance. Plus adding a coach house or conversion ADU unit would offer a far greater financial incentive to keep the property multifamily than selling for a single family. These are smart moves that don't violate private property rights and still preserve affordable housing. Most of the owners of these properties are residents of these neighborhoods and have worked hard to buy and maintain their two, three, or four flats. They may have their life savings tied up in these properties, and now you want to put a brick on their largest asset. You are taking away money they may want to use for their retirement, their families, their businesses. We are concerned that these ordinances were added to the zoning agenda at the last minute without ever holding the community meeting to get feedback from the people who would be impacted the most. I'm, in fact, I'm told that some residents asked their alderman to host a meeting when the ordinances were, were first introduced, but they received an email from staff, not a phone call, mind you, an email saying they didn't have time for a meeting and that it wasn't their ordinance. So before you go down this path and limit the life savings of people in their neighborhood, I ask that you take time to meet with these owners, ask them what it would take to keep their properties as apartments. Tell them about the property tax exemptions for improving their property. Help them utilize the AD ordinance to improve their properties and protect their investment. Give them more options, not less, to preserve their properties. So I urge you to either hold or defeat these ordinances 
until there's an opportunity to talk with the owners of the impacted properties and find viable alternatives or incentives to preserving their properties as multifamily without violating their private property rights and limiting their life savings. Thank you for, for your consideration. Thank you, Paul. Our next speaker, Brian Ubazuski. I hope I got that halfway right. So, Brian. Uh, Brian, please press star six on your phone to unmute. All right, Brian, you're still muted, it looks like. All right, we'll try to come back to you. Our next speaker is Linda Gonzalez. Hello, good morning. Uh, my name is Linda Gonzalez. I'm a 10th Ward community member speaking today to express disappointment that my alderwoman Garza is working with industry to work to weaken air quality in this area. Chicagoans and environmental justice communities are exhausted from constantly shouldering the burdens created by air pollution and environmental racism. This is not about a variance for a single development, but it's about how the city is setting baseline rules for land use and the old way doesn't work. This is not just about wards with uh, PMDs and M. This is a citywide issue. It's about the fact that other wards benefit from the burdens being placed in, word, in environmental justice communities. So all aldermen have an important role to play here and a duty to address disparities. We are not in support of uh, the air quality ordinance that was being proposed by Alderman Garza, who was working with industry on this. We demand for community-centered decision-making, and that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Our next speaker, Brianna Bertaki. Brianna? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please proceed. Hi, great. Thank you. Um, sure. Okay. Hi, my name is Brianna. I'm a member of the 10th Ward. Um, all right, in a letter released to their colleagues last Friday, our 10th Ward Alderwoman Garza's office stated the original ordinance proposed by the mayor reached, quote, too far by taking decision-making capacity away from the community and local aldermen and giving it to the Zoning Board of Appeals. We would like to raise that, in fact, Garza is enacting this exact same accusation against her constituents by blocking our participation and input on the substitute ordinance that their offices have proposed. In fact, we were only made aware of the substitute ordinance after it was finalized last Friday. To address some of the flags that were raised in the Alderwoman's revision, let us start in section 1780511D pertaining to large, large industrial developments. We appreciate the mayor's ordinance containing language that would mandate PD review and approval for buildings, storage areas, and work areas on site. Getting in front of harm is the focus here, right? In the event that these industries are encouraged simply to comply with standards, as is the language in the Alderwoman's revision, then are we not giving them the opportunity to fly under the radar, as we have seen repeatedly in our city's history many times, even recently? Our community is asking for transparent review procedures that would allow us to hold companies accountable from the start. Assuming no formal review and approval procedures are followed, how much further harm and damage are we putting our communities through until audits are performed to ensure company compliance? On this point, we recognize that Garza's revision cuts this corner, removing building storage areas and work areas on site from the requirement for PD review and approval, instead simply mandating that they, quote, be established pursuant to PD standards. On this point, the mayor's original ordinance has my support. Section 17.50200 pertaining to mining is not clear in the Alderwoman's revision. This is extraordinarily relevant for our ward in the present moment as we are looking at the potential for an Ozinga development to mimic Subtropolis in Missouri. You can Google that. It's called Subtropolis. The formal distinction between mining and the excavation requires further scrutiny under both ordinance, uh, ordinances. However, in this instance, the mayor's proposal also gets my vote as it clearly indicates that it will at least eliminate mining. To conclude, I am hesitantly in support of the mayor's initial proposal for this ordinance. I'm a member of the 10th Ward. I feel the alderman's revisions here do not hold her community's interest at heart. The zoning board submission appears to not only include more robust, I'm sorry, it does include 
more robust regulation and work to set standards to get ahead of harm. We would like to raise, however, that there is no motion in this ordinance to address or revise existing industrial sites. With our ward having around 70 industrial sites currently, we are encouraged that these motions would protect communities from further harms. And also we recognize that we still have longstanding issues with the corporations here presently. I'm in support of the original ordinance and also there is still much progress to be made at this time. That's my check, thank you. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker, Kyra Woods. Good morning. Thank you, Chairman, um, and good morning and Happy New Year again to all of the aldermen on this particular committee. Um, my name is Kyra Woods, and I am a campaign organizer with Sierra Club Illinois Chapter. Um, and this morning, I am calling to express disappointment for the deferral of Ordinance 2020-4590. We recognize in our city, incremental progress it can be extremely difficult, but it is unfortunate that the desperate protections that our communities need are being held in a battle um, between these particular two proposed ordinances that don't really have all of the pieces completely there. Um, but we would really ask that all of the members of this committee consider the priorities and progress that needs to be made. Um, Sierra Club stands in support of the Chicagoans in our environmental justice communities that continue to shoulder the burden of inaction and skewed priorities. As elected representatives of our community, we ask you to remember your commitment to community residents and not simply to corporate interests for the sake of economic development. I had the privilege yesterday of moderating a conversation uh, between uh, Cheryl Johnson of People for Community Recovery and the Riverdale community and uh, nationally renowned environmental justice leader, Dr. Robert Bullard. And Dr. Bullard reminded us that um, ultimately the cost of doing business cannot continue to be our community's health and frankly, our livelihoods. Um, it is objective that this body and in coordination with other committees, of course, within city council, craft solutions that ultimately serve our communities and keep us safe. Uh, the ordinance 45, 20, excuse me, 0, 20, 20 45, 90 um, is not in, intended to be complete, um, but is, is a necessary first step. Um, it is not about a single development, but really is calling this committee to modernize the baseline rules for our land use across our community. Uh, leaving the rules as they are will continue to harm our working class communities and particularly our communities of color um, who are, are shouldering this impact and this burden, particularly as we uh, do not make any progress or if we continue to be in a gridlock. Um, this is not simply an issue for wards with PMDs or with manufacturing designations, but this is about the collaboration across our city to ensure that no community continues to bear the burden um, of, the, of the progress and in the investments and economic opportunities. We are asking this committee to be committed to equitable development and ensuring that there are no sacrifice zones in our community of Chicago and our greater city, um, not just for the sake of racial equity, but economic progress and economic equity as well. Um, and of course, the health of our community residents. Thank you and I yield my time. Thank you. And um, I'm gonna go back to see if Brian Wierbazewski um, is unmuted and ready to speak. Hello, can people hear me now? Yes, is that Brian? Thank you, thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Brian Urbaszewski. I represent Respiratory Health Association, and I'm here to speak in support of the mayor's proposed uh, clean air ordinance, 4590. We support this important step towards addressing racial disparities in health attributed in part to the location and impact of industry on Chicago communities, especially those on the South and the West side. Last year, the city released its Healthy Chicago 2025 public health agenda. It explicitly prioritizes communities disproportionately impacted by air pollution, and it aims to increase the buffers between where people live and where industry is located. Weeks before the Healthy Chicago 2025 was released, the Chicago Department of Public Health issued an air quality report that found communities on the south and west sides are the most vulnerable to the effects of air pollution. It reiterated the city's commitment to advancing environmental justice, and addressing pressing environmental challenges. Now, diesel, exhaust, diesel engine exhaust is a significant local source of fine particulate matter, a, particulate, a pollutant tracked and regulated by the US EPA. It's responsible for asthma attacks, heart attacks, hospitalizations, and premature deaths. 
The particles are small enough to reach the deepest portions of the lungs and can affect blood chemistry as well. The diesel exhaust also contains toxic air pollutants, chemical compounds linked to neurological damage, birth defects, cancer. Given the health threats that diesel engine exhaust poses to nearby residents and the fact that warehousing, wholesaling, and freight movement facilities generating diesel truck traffic are increasing in vulnerable communities, such uses must be subject to public scrutiny and plan development review and not be given special treatment and zoning. Communities on the south and the west sides facing industrial development should be provided with the time and the courtesy to review proposals and to participate in the processes that would bring dramatic changes, traffic, and pollution to their neighborhoods. Industries wanting to operate there should undergo a review of the potential additional health burdens and not be allowed to expedite polluting operations in already overburned, overburdened and vulnerable communities. The lungs and hearts of the most vulnerable communities are at risk and they deserve protection from polluters who continue to develop properties near their homes. Thank you and that's the end of my statement. And um, that concludes the public commentary portion of the meeting. We're going to start with the regular agenda and hear the map amendments first in an effort to minimize technical difficulties and to ensure the committee meeting runs as smoothly as possible. The typical order in which items will be heard has been updated uh, throughout the duration of virtual committee on zoning meetings. Items, items will be grouped together according to witness attorney and will be heard in that order rather than the ward order. Um, Chair? Correct, uh, uh, Alderman, Alderman Head. Just wanted to be counted present. Thank you. Anyone else joined? Alderman the Burnett. Alderman Burnett and Alderman Head and Ed, okay. Um, okay, so we will go on page one of the Revised agenda, that's item number 20492T1 in the 27th Ward Ordinance was referred on uh, September 9th of 2020. Common address is 1352 West Lake Street. The change request, M23 Light Industry District to a DS-3 Downtown Service District. And we have Tim Barton or Tom Raines, which one is on there today? Uh, good morning, Chairman Tunney. This okay. is Tim Barton. All right, Tim, proceed on, on uh, Lake Street, please. Good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Timothy Barton. I'm an attorney with the law office of Thomas Raines. I'm here representing Hog Salt Incorporated or the property at 1352 West Lake Street. This matter was reviewed at the November 19th uh, plan commission. So I ask that that transcript uh, be incorporated into the record of these proceedings. Alderman uh, Raboyas moves to incorporate the records from the plan commission by the same roll call that was used to determine quorum. Any, so moved. Any objections? Hearing none, the records are incorporated. Uh, continue, Tim. Sure. Um, as you said, the site is currently zoned M23. It's being proposed for a DS uh, downtown service designation to establish a small cheval carryout and dine in hamburger restaurant. This uh, site is located in the Kinsey Industrial Corridor. Uh, therefore, the change in the zoning from a manufactured manufacturing zoned uh, designation to a non industrial zone required review by the plan commission. Um, and the previous slide, the, the shows the property improved with a one story building and an open area that was formerly used as a dog training and kennel center. Uh, it's a 6,000 square foot lot. It includes a 2,085 square foot building and a 3,900 foot pad, um, open area. The building will be rehabbed and the open area Will, be, uh, will remain as an uh, outdoor patio. Um, and the next slide, you can see the site is a block east of Ogden Avenue. Um, it's three blocks east of the Ashland L. Um, this is an area expanding rapidly with dense development. There are three um, 
plan developments in the immediate area, including one directly uh, south of the site. Um, next slide, please. This, um, next slide, thanks. Uh, this will be Small Cheval's fourth location. Um, it will have a pickup and dine-in service. Hogsalt will modify their on-premise dining um, in compliance with COVID-related guidelines. Um, two of their locations are currently open and the operator is very familiar with health, health policies um, and is keeping up to date on them. Uh, this area is still somewhat de desolate in character in the, in the immediate vicinity, uh, but this new restaurant should be a significant help in enlivening the area. Uh, this uh, proposal has been reviewed by the West Loop Community Organization, uh, as well as the neighbors of the West Loop, and um, they're, uh, both are supportive. The project has the, um, has the support of Alderman Burnett. With that, I respectfully ask for your positive recommendation. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Tim. Um, Alderman Burnett, would you like to speak on this uh, restaurant? Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Um, you know, uh, Al Cheval is a, a very popular uh, hamburger restaurant. Uh, they started one of their first ones over in the West Loop on Hospital Street. Then uh, they opened up another small Al Cheval right off of, uh, I think, Canal and uh, Washington if I'm not mistaken. Uh, it's, we're very excited to have these things coming further west. It's just, uh, you know, uh, an indication that things are starting to happen further west uh, on the near west side. Um, so we, we're very excited to have this restaurant, bring these amenities to this community to help get more foot traffic in this area and help the other businesses in the area. So I support this 100%. Now, all of our community organizations over there supported it. Uh, even the uh, West Central Association, we have three organizations over here. So I ask for the committee support. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman. Any questions from committee members? Uh, can I get a motion to move due pass by the same roll call that was used to determine quorum? Go ahead on motion to do pass. That's Alderman Cardona moves due pass as revised. All those in favor, or any objections? Any objections? Hearing none, the items passed as revised. Um, and I wanted to compliment the alderman and the applicant. Uh, obviously, you saw the before and after picture, so it's going to be a substantial improvement um, to the um, area on Lake Street. So good luck. And it looks like there's plenty of post COVID outside dining, which is great. All right. Thank you very Next. much, Chairman. Thank you, Tim. All right, bottom of page one, document number 20478, 27th Ward, ordinance was referred on September 9th of 2020. Common address 1330 to 1364 West Washington, 100 through 138 North Ada, and 1349 through 1389 West Randolph Street. This change requests C13, Neighborhood Commercial District, to a DX3 Downtown Mixed Use District, and then to a plan development. Um, our attorney is our former colleague, uh, Chairman Banks. Where are we at? So, Bill, you need to unmute. All right, one more time. Bill, Mr. Banks, you need to unmute. Can you hear me? Thank you. Uh, you can proceed, uh, Mr. Banks. Can you hear me, Tim? We can proceed. Okay, very good. Once again, sorry for that. Um, I'm a little old fashioned in my ways and uh, obviously that's catching up to me. 
At any rate, um, once again, William J.P. Banks, um, on behalf of uh, 130, Local 130, um, I am here with uh, Jerry Shane, Tyler Manick, uh, Leslie Magnavasco from Shane Banks, here with uh, Mike Fitzgerald, Travis, Travis Bridges, Gregory Jose, um, and Melissa Toops, all from the architectural firm. Gregory, of course, is in-house counsel for 130. Um, James Coyne is the business manager, along with Ken Turnquist, the financial secretary treasurer for Local 130. Also part of the team, Scott Goodman, and he is the managing partner at Fairpoint Contractors and Contractor, I should say. Um, we're here to talk a, a very about a very unique project, Mr. Chairman. And we have had a tremendous amount of outreach in the community, much like the last speaker and from the same ward um, in 27. We met with the West Community Association, Neighbors of the West Loop, West Loop Central Organization. Uh, there was a major um, um, meeting in the community. And in all respects, not only was the community in favor of our project, but were unanimous in their wishes and goals. Um, this is a very, very unusual situation in many ways because it's a seven story parking facility basically for the members of 130. And it should be for them because they're paying for it. Um, completely, totally, and without any interference or help from the government agencies or TIFs or anything else. Um, they have been longtime neighbors of this community, wonderful neighbors, as a matter of fact. Um, been at the current uh, uh, address for about 100 years, believe it or not. So they are true citizens of the city of Chicago. And when all the other agencies were running away from the West Loop, they dug in and have really maintained a, an outstanding relationship with the people and the uh, community in general. So notwithstanding the outreach, which has been extraordinary, um, not one objector to my knowledge anyway, uh, and um, this matter was before the plan commission on December the 17th, and um, at that time, it passed unanimously. Uh, and so at this time, Mr. Chairman, I would like to ask a member of the committee to um, incorporate by reference all plan commission records and findings. Well, Alderman Raboyas moves to incorporate the records from the plan commission by the same roll call that was used to determine quorum. Any objections to that motion? Hearing none. Uh, proceed, uh, Mr. Banks, and uh, we've got a lot of, we've got, a, as you well know, we've got a lot of uh, amendments today, so we can keep it. Uh, I, see, I see it. Kind of short. I'll be as brief as I, I'll be as brief as I can, Mr. Thanks, Chairman. Bill. Thank you. Okay. And um, just very brief description. This is a seven-story structure, uh, enough room for about 506 cars. 272,000 square feet of uh, commercial space, 14,700 uh, square feet on the first floor for um, additional restaurant use or what have you. The building itself is unbelievably well constructed. It has, um, it's a covered structure. And of course, with any, uh, with any structure such as this, normally you don't have to cover it, obviously, but in this case, the architects and developers decided that they wanted to talk about uh, creating something different. So the, the roof that's on this building, and that's a good picture of it, is constructed as a harvester of rainwater. So they basically, the plumbers will basically be able to maintain their facility um, independently of city water uh, to a very large extent. 
There is also um, a terrace section in the uh, in the uh, just above the restaurant section, and um, the first two floors are for use by the plumbers. And the really important issue here, and what I think is most important to the people of the community, because it's a parking desert for all intents and purposes, this will give the community people the ability to use these facilities, everything above the first two floors um, for their use and uh, for the community's use. Uh, the green space is extraordinary. Um, it is one of the, the other positive points. Uh, the, I, we, as a matter of fact, you can't really find any negatives with this project. City of Chicago itself benefits tremendously. As you know, there's a car tax, uh, parking tax, uh, other taxes such as retail sales tax, things like this that'll be in play. And in fact, uh, about $130,000 a year will go back to the city of Chicago. And um, that's without property taxes, et cetera. And um, that being the case. And there's 200. Pardon? I'm sorry. Continue. Okay. Um, for the most part, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, we've had a tremendous amount of input back and forth with the sitting alderman. Alderman uh, um, Burnett has been outstanding in putting together the meetings, et cetera, helping us do that anyway. Um, I, the benefits are unbelievable. Once again, the, the, um, All right. the tag, the property, uh, I'm trying to be as quick as I can, but I'm getting- Well, we're there. gonna hear from Alderman Burnett on the community process, I'm sure, so. Yeah, as a matter of fact, I just wanted to make it clear that this was a um, matter that was paid for by the plumbers themselves. It's a $25 million project and it, they are really giving back to this community. Um, Mr. Chairman, um, if I may uh, ask at this particular time to, that you recognize um, the Alderman for his comment. I will, thank you, Alderman Burnett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. As the uh, counselor said, they met with all the community organizations. Everyone's excited about this. This is another example of something coming west. This is not too far from the Archibald uh, proposal that was just presented. Uh, so things are coming west and uh, going over, getting ready to go over um, Ogden in this area. Uh, we appreciate it that uh, the plumbers uh, are staying in the community and figuring out a way to stay in the community and, and be prosperous. Uh, so we thank them and their members for their commitment to our neighborhood. Uh, we also appreciate the fact that they're putting a, a parking lot up. No one, no one in this city is building freestanding parking lots anymore. So we appreciate that. That's going to benefit the community. It's going to benefit all of the businesses that's moving to this area and all of the offices. So we're excited about this. I thank the Department of Planning uh, the Department of Planning been very uh, diligent in, 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 in pushing the envelope, uh, trying to make sure that this is a, uh, a, a nice uh, parking lot in our community. And I look forward to the other things that the Plumbers Union are gonna do with their property in the future. So I ask for the committee support on this. I support it, my community support it, and thank you. Thank you, Alderman. Um, I see um, Alderman Ray Lopez's hand is up. Alderman Lopez. Thank you, Chairman, and good morning, members of the committee. I just want to commend my colleague, our colleague, Alderman Burnett. I did have a question. Um, you said that the roof is going to be like a, a collector for rainwater. Where is it stored at? And how will it be purified for, is it for, just for landscaping use? Is it for interior use? Which is very right. interesting how you're working it. All right. Oh, it's a, it's a, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, uh, uh, Mr. Banks, uh, answer the question, please, about the uh, harvesting. Well, it's a basically a design system in some of the newer buildings 
And uh, as far as all of the uh, technicalities involved, it's really for use, um, not only just to, uh, as a watering agent, it's also to use and process water uh, at the site. So it, uh, it is a very, very expansive uh, um, type of uh, design, designed to uh, be used for the whole project. Is that Raymond? Did you did I hear where it's going to be stored? Was the question part of it? Yes. I'm I'm not familiar with the storage portion. Well, I know of you this. got plenty of plenty of people on your team, and I think I know the answer, but I would rather hear it from the from the plumber's perspective. I'm sure the plumbers Mike? know where to put water. Yeah. <laughs> very, very curious as to where they do. Well, they do that. So, so from what I understand, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, the Solomon plumbers, Burnett. Mm -hmm. The plumbers are going to reuse the rainwater. Yeah. Um, yes. To, right. So like when you flush the toilet and all of those things, they reuse that water in their facilities. Absolutely. Yeah. And and I. But where it's where it's stored, I am not one hundred percent sure. Okie doke. Yeah. The reason I bring it up, and, and I, I, you know, I don't want to get into too belabor the point, I just think it's a great model perhaps to look at for other buildings moving forward, um, particularly as we see water becoming more and more a scarce commodity with you know, water futures being a highly traded commodity now. You know, making our buildings giant collectors in the city definitely should be something that we look at and possibly incorporate into the, uh, municipal, into the building code. Thank you, Chairman. Alderman Hopkins. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and I just want to uh, offer my support for this project and congratulate Alderman Burnett uh, on successfully leading the community review process to fruition. Uh, seems to be an outstanding program. Uh, congratulations to the plumbers and to Farpoint Development. Uh, I can personally attest to the lack of parking in that area as a veteran of many uh, hockey games at Johnny's Ice House. <laughs> Times I almost missed the opening face off because I was circling the block. So uh, me, clearly me there's too, a need for this. Uh, my only question is um, regarding the uh, retail space. Are there any uh, letters of intent or any potential retail tenants uh, on the horizon that would be considered uh, an ideal use um, for the retail space? We um, do have, we haven't made a decision on that yet as to which one we would pick, but yes, we do have offers and, um, but we're still in the talking stages of this one. Um, in, in addition, if I can go back to that question, uh, with all the modern device, devices we now have, I was able to ascertain through the um, uh, the grapevine that the water, by the way, uh, Alderman Lopez, is stored underground. Okay. Does that help? Yep. <laughs> and and I, Chairman Banks, I knew that because I did take a I had an opportunity to visit their uh, this the the hall itself, and they use that same kind of technology in their building. So it's exciting to see uh, this water uh, um, preservation efforts and uh, kudos to the team and to the plumbers union. I don't see any other hands up. Uh, can I get a motion uh, to move due pass by the same nope. roll call that was used to determine I quorum? Move. Alderman Lopez. I move. Alderman uh, Raymond Lopez moves due pass. Any objections? Hearing none, the item is passed as revised, I believe. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you to the team and thank you to all at the Plumbers Union. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right. Uh, now we're on the top of page two, uh, document number 20494 T1 in the 47th Ward. Ordinance was referred on September 9th of 2020. Common address 1800 through 1808 West Bernice, Hello. Bernice Avenue and 3834 through 3844 North Ravenswood Avenue. The change request is a B2.15 neighborhood mixed use district and M12 limited manufacturing business park district to a B23 neighborhood mixed use district. And we have Katrina McGuire. Good morning, Good morning. Katrina. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Um, again, Katrina McGuire from Thompson Coburn. Um, here on behalf of the applicant, uh, with me today are Patrick Landrosh uh, representing the applicant, as well as Chris Michelak of Sullivan Goulet, who's the project architect. Um, 
uh, briefly, this is a matter that we engaged heavily with Alderman Martin um, and his staff on, and we're grateful for their time. We also met with the community organizations as well as with our immediate neighbors. Um, as a result of those meetings and discussions, the project has evolved and we are currently proposing a six story um, transit oriented mixed use building with approximately 3000 square feet of commercial space on the ground floor and about 9,000, uh, 9,900 square feet of commercial space on the second floor contemplated as office space. The proposed building will have 40 dwelling units, four efficiency units that are located on the third through the sixth floors and 25 parking spaces, 40 bicycle parking spaces. Um, this project will provide 20% um, affordable um, all on site. Um, we do have a letter of support from Alderman Martin, but it is my understanding that he might be with us this morning as well. Um, and with that, we would be certainly available for any questions. Thank you, Katrina. Um, I know we have a letter of support from Alderman Martin. I don't think he's on the call this morning. Uh, do, uh, do we have to accept the substitute? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm sorry. So um, I, Alderman Raboyas moves to accept the substantive narrative and plans for the type one application by the same roll call that was used to determine quorum. Any objections to that? All right, hearing none, the substantive narrative and plans are accepted. Um, and now, if there's any other questions, questions from committee members. All right, hearing no questions, can I get a motion to move to pass? Uh, we'll move, Mr. Chairman, Alderman Austin. Alderman Austin moves uh, to pass on the substantive, substantive narrative plans. Uh, all those in favor, aye. Any objections to that? All right. Hearing no objections, uh, it, this uh, motion's passed with a substantive narrative and plans. Thank you, Katrina. Thank you very much. All right, move, middle of page two, document number 20479, 27th Ward. Ordinance was referred on September 9th of 2020. This address, 1465 through 1483 North Kingsbury St Street, 835 through 919 West Blackhawk Street, and 1450 through 1472 North Dayton Street. Uh, the change request. Business plan development number 1292, which has uh, underlying C35 commercial manufacturing and employment district to a C25 motor vehicle related commercial district to a residential plan development 1292 as amended. Sounds like a lot, Katrina. Why don't you explain it to the committee members? Please? It is. Uh, thank you again, Mr. Chairman. Uh, again, for the record, Katrina McGuire from Thompson Coburn here on behalf of the applicant. Uh, with me this morning should be Mike Drew from Structured Development, as well as Ryan Von Drail of Grec Architects. Uh, this is a matter that was heard by the Plan Commission at their December 17th hearing, and we do enjoy unanimous support by the Plan Commission. We would ask that the records of the, of the proceedings before the Plan Commission be incorporated herein. So Alderman uh, Cardona moves to incorporate the records from the plan commission by the same roll call that was used to determine quorum. Any objections to that? Hearing none, the records are incorporated. Uh, continue, Katrina. Thank you. Um, and I know in the interest of time, uh, you have a busy agenda, but I'd like to make a brief presentation on this project. Uh, this is a matter that's in the heart of the Halstead Triangle, uh, bound by Kingsbury, Blackhawk, and Dayton, um, and is the first project uh, to be approved um, after the amendment to the Halstead Triangle Plan, which occurred back in August of 2020. Uh, next slide, please. This is a project that's going to be, that will be developed in five sub areas, as you can see here. Um, on the right side of the screen is sub area D, which is currently under construction. Uh, sub area A, B, and C are contemplated as new construction buildings, um, which will be flanking a, a publicly accessible but privately owned park. Next slide, please. Sub area A is a 327 unit rental building with ground floor commercial uses. Next slide, please. Uh, sub area B is contemplated as a 34 unit all affordable condominium building directly adjacent to the park. Next slide, please. And building C is a 126 unit rental building on the other side of the park. Next slide, please. And this is just a rendering of the sports um, and entertainment, sports and recreation facility that is currently under construction in sub area D. It is contemplated as a rock climbing facility. Next slide, please. 
Um, here's just a highlight of the, the park. It's an element of the project that we're very proud of. It's a half acre park that involves a dog park, community garden, a play area, and a variety of landscape and hardscape features. This is a park that's going to be subject to a public access easement agreement, as well as a development and maintenance agreement with the city of Chicago. Again, as I mentioned, it will be publicly accessible and privately funded and ma maintained. Next slide. Um, here's just a, a view from the Northwest showing both in the forefront uh, building A, the condo building, the low rise at building B, and then in the background building C. Next slide, please. And this is sort of from the back of the project. This highlights the park. Um, and as you can see, the open, the amenity spaces for the three buildings to be constructed all um, face the park as well. Next slide. One of the key elements of the Halstead Triangle plan update was to enhance the pedestrian experience. And uh, the project team worked very closely with the Department of Planning and Development as well as CDOT to eliminate driveways as well as to enhance uh, the pedestrian experience through building design as well. Next slide, please. This is just another view uh, focused on the, the condominium building. And as you can see there between building C and A, the access to the park, this is viewed from Blackhawk. Next slide, please. Uh, between buildings A and B, um, a paseo is being created, which provides some opportunities for open space and overflow space within the retail uh, within building A, as well as an additional access point for pedestrians to the park, which you can see uh, in the rear. Next slide. Um, this is a project that provided a, a unique opportunity for the developer to provide for sale family-sized affordable units uh, we engaged very heavily and closely with the Department of Housing in the programming of this, and we're certainly grateful for their time. Half of the affordable units will be provided on site within the development in the 34 unit all affordable condominium building in sub area B, which is the picture at the bottom of your screen, which consists primarily of three and four bedroom units. Um, the developer has also agreed to pay for professional property management for a year after turnover will fund a year's worth of reserves as well as the first three months of condominium assessments for each homeowner. And then an additional 33 units will be provided offsite um, still within the 27th ward within a for sale townhome community located at Harrison Francisco. The townhomes are three bedroom, two and a half bath homes. All of the units will be included in the Chicago Community Land Trust portfolio. Next slide, please. And just finally and briefly, uh, some of the economic and community benefits that will result um, from this development. As I mentioned before, the half acre privately owned publicly accessible park, a developer funded traffic signal at Blackhawk and Halstead, resurfacing of perimeter streets, uh, $3 million in real estate tax proceeds um, with approximately 1000 construction jobs with a commitment by the developer to fulfill the city's um, MBWB goals. And with that, um, our project, I mean, our presentation is done. I understand um, Alderman Burnett is present uh, and we're certainly available for questions. All right, Alderman Burnett. Alderman Burnett on this uh, large but handsome project. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, I wanna uh, commend the Department of Planning and Development. Um, as you know, we, uh, we changed this area to allow for residential to go in this and we went through a procedure uh, with the community in order to make that happen. Uh, I wanna thank the residents over in that area, although the residents in that area, uh, immediate area are Alderman Hopkins uh, residents, but they uh, approved this project. Uh, the developer um, is doing 20% affordable. He's doing 10% on site. As you can see, he's, he's doing an affordable building and he's gonna do 10% offsite over on uh, around uh, Francisco and uh, Harrison Street. He's building townhomes, uh, uh, townhome development on the west side where we haven't had development in over 50 years uh, to happen. And uh, he also uh, took the liberty to mentor guys from that community and allow them to build one of the houses, one of the townhomes themselves. Uh, so I, I really appreciate uh, this development. I appreciate the, uh, the New North Unity program. We had a meeting uh, with this developer in the community. Uh, everyone was very impressed and excited about it. This is close to the wild mile. It's gonna enhance the uh, 
wild mild or green space that's happening on the uh, river there. Uh, this is this is uh, going to benefit the community a lot, bring a lot of jobs, bring housing. Uh, this is a win-win for the city. It's a win-win for this community, win-win for affordable housing. So we support this 100% and so does our community. And we ask for the committee support also. Thank, Thank you, you, Alderman. I see Alderman Kerry Austin's hand is up. Kerry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I would just like to ask uh, the presenter, uh, what's the price range of the affordable? I don't know, Mike, if you want to answer specific pr uh, price points, but the affordable condominiums will be priced at 100% of AMI and eligible for purchasers up to 120% of AMI. So, um, Alderman Austin, this is um, Mike Drew. I'm the developer for structured development. Uh, the the on-site condominiums are, again, family size, three and four bedroom condominiums, and they'll be priced at a maximum of 330 to $360,000, uh, which is about uh, a half to a fraction of what market rate is in the area around this development. The 33 family size three bedroom townhomes at Harrison and Francisco are being sold in the first phase for $229,000 uh, per unit. And we've completed the first phase. There are seven units that are currently for sale and are going through the uh, CCLT process uh, for qualified buyers. Okay. Uh, thank you. Well, uh, I grew up right down the street, 1520 North Mohawk. Okay. <laughs> so I was like, okay, it has changed tremendously, but I'd have to say it's absolutely beautiful. Thank, thank you, you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Alderman. Um, Alderman. Viegas, did you have your hand up? Gil? Chairman, I put it down, thank you. Okay, all right, any other questions from committee members? If uh, I- uh, Mr. Chairman. That is Sorry. Alderman Hopkins. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, once again, thank Alderman Burnett for his cooperation. Um, he's entirely right. Uh, he and I share uh, some common borders where the uh, issue might be in one ward um, but the residents happen to be across the uh, ward boundary and the other. Uh, and he and I have uh, developed a rapport over the years. Um, we know how to handle that and uh, we know how to work um, cooperatively with the residents uh, as was the case in this project. I'm aware of no opposition. Uh, and that wasn't always the case. There were a number of different ideas that have been floated for this particular parcel over the years. Um, this is by far the best uh, and the residents know it. Um, so we're very pleased to be moving forward with this. Uh, I want to commend the development team. And uh, once again, thank Alderman Burnett uh, for working cooperatively uh, with the second ward residents in this area uh, to get to a win-win. Uh, this is a good project and I'm pleased to support it. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman. I don't see other hands up. So can I get a motion to move to pass by the same roll call that was used to determine quorum? So moved. So moved. moved Cardona. The last one I can hear is Cardona. So all of me Cardona moves uh, do pass. Um, any objections? Hearing none, the item is passed as revised. All right, Katrina, I think we're done with you for the day. I For now? Okay. All right. I hope Bot so, she already left. All right, pa bottom, bottom of page two, document number 20565T1. First Ward, ordinance was referred on December 16th of 2020. Common address, 650 North Wood Street and the change request. RS3 residential single unit detached house to an RM 5.5 residential multi-unit district. Sarah Barnes. Sarah. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Sarah Barnes, and I'm an attorney with the offices of Sam Banks, located at 221 North LaSalle Street. Happy to be here this morning on behalf of the applicant. Um, the applicant is the owner of the loan commercial unit, which is located within the first floor of the existing eight unit mixed use condominium building, which aside from the applicant's unit, currently contains a total of eight dwelling units. Despite many years of diligent and exhaustive efforts to secure a long-term and compatible tenant for the commercial unit, 
Such incredible efforts have remained completely fruitless, causing significant irreconcilable loss to the applicant above and beyond just the mental frustration. As such, the applicant is seeking the subject zoning map amendment, which will allow for the conversion of this single commercial unit into a single dwelling unit, um, which will be added to the existing homeowners association. No physical expansion of the existing building is necessary or intended. All of the work um, for the conversion will be confined solely within the building. Um, towards this end, and as a matter of relevant background, in particular in light of the recent passage of the additional dwelling unit ordinance, um, the applicant began this process over three years ago um, under the previous administration, the applicant spent the last or at least 18 months meeting with the Chicago Grand and Neighbors Association toward the effectuation of this proposal and ensuring a robust community review. As well and along the way, the applicant suffered a tragic family loss, which rightfully so left this matter tabled for many, many months. Um, we recently finally filed the application, the subject application for the zoning change. And the reason that we did not file or avail ourselves to the ADU ordinance is because the physicality of the existing building um, already exceeds the FAR, the underlying FAR in the um, RS3 zoning district. And as a result, we don't qualify or meet the requirements for the ADU ordinance and had to proceed with the zoning change. Um, towards these ends, in addition to the support of the Chicago Grand Neighbors Association, we also um, have met with Alderman Laspada and do have an acknowledgement um, of his non-opposition. With all of that, we very respectfully request the support and approval of this honorable committee, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. I think that was Ms. Spada. All right, we do have a letter from Alderman Ms. Spada in support of this. Um, is he on? Is he on? Okay, so I think he's just joined the call. Daniel, you wanna speak on the Northwood application, please? Chairman, yes, um, it is a really great proposal. We really appreciate how comprehensive the community process has been. And it really is in line with the overall, not only the zoning, but the feel of Wood Street. I've, I've walked the street. If anything, a, a commercial space at this particular intersection on the street there did not really make sense for the surrounding area. So in this case, converting it to residential makes the most sense for the community. And we also really appreciate the review work done by the Chicago Grand Neighborhood Association. Thank you, Alderman. Uh, quick question, what's the number of parking spaces on this thing? Um, that's a good question. I believe we are at, uh, one second, Chairman, sorry. It's four and it will remain four. Um, they're in a garage. It's a detached garage. Okay, I, I get the number. Yeah. Daniel, that was brought up in the community, right? So they're fine with four. That's my understanding as well. And I mean, arguably, if, if you were using this space as a commercial space, you would need more parking rather than less. So I, yeah. I think it makes Great. a lot of sense. Great. All right, questions from committee members. Move to pass, Mr. Right. Chairman. Hearing Dowell. no questions, Alderman, uh, Alderman Dowell moves to pass. Uh, any objections to her motion? Hearing none, the item's passed. Thank you. Um, and now we're at the, staying with Sarah, we're on the top of page three, document number 20571, 31st Ward, ordinance was referred on December 16th of 2020. Address, 4921 West Belmont Avenue, and the change request, B11, Neighborhood Shopping District, to a C21 Motor Vehicle Related District. Sarah? Thank you once more, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Once again, for the record, my name is Sarah Barnes, and I'm an attorney at the offices of Sam Banks, located at 221 North LaSalle Street. 
Happy to be here once again on behalf of the applicant auto renew group um, for the last 17 plus years, the applicant has been successfully operating a detailing and reconditioning automobile repair shop in Addison, Illinois. Due to changes in development patterns in Addison, the applicant is being forced to relocate its operations. As serendipity would have it, such relocation will bring him to Chicago, more specifically and very happily to the 31st Ward. Which brings us to the subject property on Belmont Avenue, which such property is already improved with a one-story industrial building that has been operating as a similar automobile service shop for many years. Those operations are non-conforming under the current B zoning classification. Towards these ends, the current operator at that subject site recently decided to close its doors. The applicant, therefore, is seeking to keep the site activated by relocating its operations into the existing building. In doing so, and because a completely new license is required for the applicant as a new operator, the applicant is required to bring the underlying zoning for the property into compliance with the ongoing vehicular operations, um, which such operations include some light painting. Hence the subject zoning map amendment, which is intended to and is necessary to do just that, to bring the use into compliance um, with the current zoning ordinance. As part of this process, we first reached out to and met with Alderman Cardona to discuss the operations and the admi administrative challenges that the applicant has encountered in seeking a license for the property. Alderman Cardona has been instrumental and actively engaged in our ongoing efforts towards these ends. Um, along these same lines and as part of the proposal, the applicant intends to work in conjunction with the Alderman's office toward hiring employees from within the ward in addition to the several existing employees and customers who actually already reside in the neighborhood. Um, the applicant is extremely excited to make the 31st Ward its new home in which to continue to contribute and grow. And with that, I um, also want to extend my personal gratitude to Alderman Cardona in his um, efforts towards helping us out with this zoning change. I believe that Alderman Cardona is in session right now um, with yeah, us. So, so, he may so we're ready to hear from him if you're if you're finished with your report. Thank All you, right. Chairman. Alderman and Cardona. Thank you, Chairman, members of the committee. Um, this is great. Uh, small businesses uh, trying to keep them open, especially under the pandemic, and also for the neighborhood. Um, met with the owner when he was interested in uh, buying a piece of property. We had several talks and especially employing uh, people from the community is one of the best things that we could do for our community itself. So I, I look for your favorable support from, my, from the committee and yourself uh, for the zoning change. Thank you. Men or uh, the applicant. Hearing no questions, can I get a motion moved to pass by the same roll call that was used to determine quorum? So moved, Mr. Pass. Chairman, yeah. Alderman Austin. The Alderman Austin moved to pass. Any objections? Hearing none, the item is passed. And I, uh, congratulations, Alderman. And Sarah, um, I think that's your last. Uh, what's with the Cubs uh, World Series uh, backdrop there? Was that trying to get on my good side or what? I'm just, I'm still trying to live the dream because I don't know when that dream's ever going <laughs> to happen again. And I'm dealing with the Bears debacle. So I don't have much going for me right now. Well, you know, we're a, divi <laughs> we're a divided ward. We have some White Sox fans here in the 45. Uh, we'll see one of those for the White Sox next year, I think. Um, All righty. Okay. So to, uh, towards that alderman or chairman, excuse me. Um, my office still has a couple items later on in the agenda. I believe Daniel's going to be handling those, but it, he might be logging in under my um, okay. Zoom. So you can just keep me active if you want. I'll okay. mute myself and stop the video for now, though. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Sarah. Middle of page three, document number 20578, 8th Ward. Ordinance was referred on December 16th of 2020. Common address, 1503 East, 74th place, and the change request, RS3, residential single unit detached house, to an RT4, residential two flat townhouse and multi-unit district. And we have Mark Kubiak. Mark. Alderman, uh, Mark here. 
Uh, yes, for sir. some reason, I don't have a, um, a video button. Oh, there's a video. <clears throat> Thank you. My name is Mark Kupiak. I'm an attorney with offices 77 West Washington. I represent the applicant uh, on this particular matter. Um, on 74th place, we've got a property that's improved with an existing old original two flat building. Um, the uh, building's vacant and need of repairs. Actually recently suffered some fire damage. Uh, the applicant plans to remodel the building and the uh, zoning change would allow him to establish a basement apartment. The rent from that basement apartment would help with the expenses of the rehab and also provide an additional dwelling unit. We've worked with the alderman's office to explain the project and the situation, asked for her support, and I believe uh, a letter from the alderman has been sent. Hopefully you have it. We, we do have a letter of support from Alderman Michelle Harris. Are you and with that, I'd ask for your support. Thank you, sir. Uh, questions from committee members? Can I get a motion to move to pass by the same roll call that was used? Move to pass. Rodriguez. Uh, that was uh, Alderman Rodriguez. Uh, moves to pass. Any objections to that motion? Hearing none, the item is passed. All right. Uh, Mark, we're on the bottom of page three. It's my understanding that we're going to, this item needs to be deferred. Yes, we'd like to defer that, please. Is that based on, you're, you're making that request? Yes. Okay. So let me read it into the record. Document number 205-82-T1, 27th Ward. Ordinance was referred on December 16th of 2020. Uh, address 16, 615 North Ogden. Change request. M12 Limited Manufacturing Business Park District to a B25 Neighborhood Mixed Use District. And at the request of the attorney, um, the item needs to be deferred. Can I get a motion to defer the item by the same roll call that was used to determine quorum? Cardona. Move to. Alderman Cardona yes. moves uh, to defer the item. Any objections? Hearing none, the item's deferred. Thank you. All right. Top of page four. We're moving on item number 20547, T1, 22nd Ward. Ordinance was referred on November 16th of 2020. The common address, 3925 West 31st Street. And the change request, B31 Community Shopping District to a B35 Community Shopping District. Uh, I think we have some changes on this one. Let's start. Mark? Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, my name is Mark Kupiak. I'm an attorney with offices at 77 West Washington, represent the applicant. <clears throat> and yes, procedurally, uh, we do have a substitute ordinance, which has been a copy of which sent to the zoning department and your committee. Uh, the, the alderman, after filing, the alderman asked us to take a closer look at this. And upon further research, we've determined that the project can be done in a B3-2 district. So the substitute ordinance would rezone it to a B3-2. And along with that, uh, the B3-2 would not require a type one application. So we would like to revise our application, withdraw our plans and narrative and proceed with the B3-2 as a regular type two application. Okay, so um, we are going to ask for the substitute to be accepted and for the benefit of the committee members, uh, we're changing the zoning from the B3, B31 to B32 versus what was originally a B35. And then this is no longer a T1. It'll be done under the straight zoning of B32. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Can I'm I get a motion to accept I'm that substitute? So move, Mr. So move Chairman. Alderman Dowell. Uh, moves on that substitute. Any objections to her motion? Hearing on the substitute is uh, before us and accepted. All right. Uh, now we want to hear from, uh, Mark, are you finished? Uh, I'll, I'll just briefly describe it. Okay. Property is currently improved with the building. Uh, the building housed a former meat market the applicant plans to build a partial, partial second floor addition to add some floor area. This would allow a local doctor to move his existing office, which is located down the street, into this building, which would give him more space where he'd be better able to serve his patients. Uh, 
many of the patients are from the local area. <clears throat> At the Alderman's request, we did two virtual community meetings, one during the day, one in the evening. We did have a Spanish interpreter available for those meetings. And the alderman was also present at both meetings to explain the project and answer the questions of the neighbors who, who called in. And with that, uh, I believe we have the alderman um, uh, here. We followed up with him to ask him for right. his support. Good, well, uh, Alderman Rodriguez is on the call. Mike, you wanna talk about this one? Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Um, yeah, I'm happy to be in support of this effort. Uh, I think the applicant who we know well in the community, over 30 years of work in the community, um, and their proposal will redo an uh, unsightly um, corner building in the heart of our community, and will add a pharmacy, not just to the clients of the doctor, but also to the community residents and additional parking spaces. So uh, there were no objections in our community meetings and I uh, support this, heart, this uh, whole project wholeheartedly. Thank Question, you. Questions for the Alderman. Just quickly, uh, Mike, uh, what is the parking? Uh, since that was part of the, the larger upzoning was the parking requirements. So how many parking spaces will be available for the uh, project? I believe they're adding five spaces. Okay. All right. Okay, any questions, comments? All right. Um, can I get a motion to move to pass um, on this item that was substituted by the same roll call that was used to determine quorum? Cardona move. did pass. Cardona uh, moves the uh, substitute. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed to it? All right. So this item is being passed as substituted. Um, I think that's it for that one. Thank, Thank you. you. Middle of page four, Docu num document number 205-84-T1, 12th Ward, ordinance was referred on December 16th of 2020, common address 2401 South Holman Avenue and 3349 through 3359 West 24th Street. The change request, RT4 residential two flat townhouse and multi-unit district to an RM 5.5 residential, residential multi-unit district. We have Rolando Acosta. Rolando. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Rolando Acosta here on behalf of the applicant for this matter. Uh, the subject property contains approximately 3,600 square feet of land. It's improved with a tall two-story building uh, that is located at the corner of 24th Street and Holman. The building is in rather uh, deteriorated shape. The applicant proposes to rehabilitate the building, add four units to the building, by making use of the existing basement, which is a full height basement, as well as the attic, which is significantly tall. Uh, and for that purpose, it, has, it seeks uh, the rezoning of the property to RM 5.5. One parking space will be added to the property. The building occupies almost the entire uh, site. So that is all that we have room for. We'll visit the uh, Zoning Board of Appeals to seek a variance with respect to the other parking spaces. With that, Mr. Chairman, I believe the uh, Alderman, Alderman Cardenas, has submitted a letter of support to your committee, um, and I would stand for any questions you may have. All right. We do have a letter of support from Alderman Cardenas. Any uh, questions from committee members? Hearing none, got a motion to move to pass by the same roll call that was used to determine quorum. No move, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> That's Alderman Beal. Moves do pass. Any objections to the motion? Hearing none, the item's passed. Uh, thank you, Rolando. We're gonna stay with you on the bottom of page four. Uh, document number 205-77-T1, 12th Ward. Ordinance was referred on December 16th of 2020. Common address, 3300 West Pershing Road, 3846 through 3858 South Spalding Avenue. The ch this change request, RS3, residential single unit detached house district to an RM6, residential multi-unit district. Rolando. Again, Mr. Chairman, Rolando Acosta here on behalf of the applicant. This is very similar to the uh, prior matter. This is another corner building that has a full basement and full attic. 
and uh, was significantly deteriorated. The applicant proposes to rehabilitate the building and add uh, three units to the property. This building is actually built to its property line, so it will not be able to, uh, no additional parking will be able to be added, but this is, a, I believe, a very welcome change in this neighborhood as this building has stood in what is a dilapidated state for probably over a decade at this point. Again, Mr. Alderman Cardenas has submitted a letter of support and I would be happy to answer any questions the committee may have. Thank you, Rolanda. We do have a letter of support from Alderman Cardenas. Uh, questions by committee members? Can I get a motion moved to pass by the same roll call that was used to determine quorum? Move to pass, Chairman. Alderman Wagus Back. Okay. Back moves to pass. Any objections to his motion? Hearing none, the item is passed. All right. Uh, now we're on the top. Yes. Top of page five. App uh, application number 20554T1. 12th Ward ordinance was referred on November 16th of 2020. This common address, 3723 to 3753 South Archer Avenue, also 3728 to 3904 South Western Avenue, and the change request, M22 Light Industry District to a C11 Neighborhood Commercial District. Rolando. Um, again, Mr. Chairman, Rolando Acosta here on behalf of the applicant. This is an approximately 61,000 square foot parcel that sits at the corner of Western and Archer. It currently contains a vacant Walg former Walgreens store that's been vacant for about five years. The applicant proposes to uh, demolish the existing store and redevelop the property with two buildings, a Northern building that will contain a 7-Eleven convenience store with gas pumps. I believe some of you may have seen these now uh, throughout the city. And then on the southern portion of the property, a Starbucks with a drive-through. Uh, the gasoline function as well as the drive-through function for Starbucks will require special uses uh, that would we would pursue should we be approved today. The property is currently, not, notwithstanding the fact that it was used for a Walgreens for many years, it's zone M22, rather heavy manufacturing. It's across from McKinley Park. Um, we seek to rezone it to C11 for the proposed use. We had a community, a virtual community meeting uh, that was well attended, approximately 30 people. And we had a subsequent meeting with the McKinley Park uh, Advisory Council. Both, of, both meetings yielded support for the project. And I believe the Alderman has also submitted a letter of support for this matter. We do, again, have a letter of support from Alderman Cardenas. Um, we have a question from Alderman Ray Lopez, I see. Raymond. Thank you, Chairman. Good morning, Rolando. Good morning, sir. The uh, entrances and exits for the for the two businesses. I know that's kind of a very that's a very busy intersection, especially with the bus stop there. Are they going to be using the, only the two entrances that exist currently, or will they be adding to that? So we are using the existing entrances. One of them will be slightly shifted to the south, but effectively it will replace the existing. There's two entrances currently off of Western. There's also one entrance off of Archer. Right. So those will be retained and used for this project. We have done a traffic study for this uh, and it is under review by CDOT, but our indications were that everything is appropriately located to not uh, impair traffic along Western. And as far as Archer as well, because I know yes. when people come under the viaduct, you know, that's a, people tend to stop. <laughs> Yes, yes. Our, our existing, there's an existing driveway off of Archer that's essentially across from Burger King. I know that you know this area fairly well, and that will remain and it keeps the sight lines. It also keeps all of the landscaping that is along the frontage. That's going to re remain and be actually augmented. Awesome. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Any other questions? If not, can I get a motion moved to pass by the same roll call that was used to determine? Uh, Alderman Hopkins, pleased to make this motion on behalf of my childhood neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Okay, Alderman Hopkins moves to pass. Any objections to his uh, childhood motion? Yeah. Hopkins Plaza, yes. Hearing none, <laughs> item is passed. All righty. Thank you. Uh, now we're gonna be moving to the middle of page five. 
Document number 20579T1, 15th Ward. Ordinance was referred on December 16th of 2020. Common address, 4834 South Oakley Avenue. Change request, M22 Light Industry District to a C32 Commercial Manufacturing and Employment District. We have uh, Mitchell Weinstein, I believe. Hi, Chairman. This is uh, Kevin Coyne. I work with Mitch. I'm standing in today. Okay. Let's okay? talk about the application on Oakley, please. Well, thank you, uh, Chairman, and thank you to the committee for hearing us today. Again, I'm Kevin Coyne and practice with the law firm Chuak and Texan, which is located in the Loop here in Chicago. I represent the petitioner South Oakley Venture LLC, and today we are asking for a type one zoning map amendment from M2-2 Light Industrial District to C3-2 Commercial Manufacturing and Employment District. Uh, the purpose of the request is to allow for a very small part of this uh, industrial building to be allowed uh, to be used for a commercial art studio. Uh, with respect to the subject property, it is located again at 4834 South Oakley Avenue. Uh, the property is a one-story industrial building of approximately 43,250 square feet in size and is located near the intersection of Southwestern Avenue, uh, near the intersection of Southwestern Avenue and 49th Street. Um, it is can, uh, located also just two blocks away from the CTA Western Avenue Orange Line and CTA Bus Line 49. Uh, the petitioner's related entity, Bridgewater Studio, is now operating from the subject site. Uh, Bridgewater has been in operation since 2014, and their business uh, line is in custom artwork design and fabrication. Bridgewater was recently awarded a sizable NOF award to administer and incorporate a, a, a business incubator into its building and operations. That incubator will serve neighborhood artists and provide those artists with an opportunity uh, to find a, a workspace to accommodate their design and, uh, and art, and also potentially may be used to accommodate a small amount of retail presence. The uh, incubator will again comprise, no show, is will comprise a small part of this building, only about a thousand square feet. Uh, but that was enough to trigger today's uh, request to accommodate uh, the use. Uh, we believe this use will have no negative impact on neighboring properties nor detract from neighboring manufacturing. Uh, the approval of this zoning change will allow for the NOF award to proceed, which will again lead to this art incubator that will cultivate new artists and provide for artistic outlets within the city of Chicago. Uh, moreover, this approval will further allow for the continued growth of this uh, Chicago Small Business, which is creating jobs and artistic opportunities for our city. Uh, we've received no neighbor complaints to our, uh, our petition, and we also thank Alderman Lopez for his letter of support, a copy of which, uh, Chairman Tunney, I emailed to yourself and to uh, Nicole at the beginning of the uh, meeting today. Uh, so we re re uh, respectfully request the support of the entirety of the committee today. Um, I'm available to answer any questions that any of you may have about the operation or our petition. We have uh, one of the managers of the business is also online in case there's an operational question that any of you may have. Great. Thank you. Um, we do have a letter of support from Alderman Lopez. He's on the call. Um, I know it's an exciting project for his ward. Um, Raymond, would you like to talk about this? Yes, Chairman, thank you. And thank you again, members of the committee. Um, and I'm sorry, Kevin, who's on the call with us today? Eric Cup. Well, thank you. I'm, I was trying to go through Zoom to figure out who was with us. Um, we're joined by one of the uh, managing partners, Eric. Um, it's really exciting to see Bridgewater Studios in the 15th Ward. Um, they are going and growing places um, in our community. They are not only creating uh, this new space, but they're creating new opportunities for residents with an artistic bent. And yes, they were one of the recipients of a $1.4 million NOF grant to allow them to expand, to allow them to become and had to have an even greater presence in our back of the arts community. They are committed to working with our youth to allow them the opportunity to get involved with um, what they do, to express their artistic talent and to pursue their own dreams. And I could not be prouder of the work that they've done uh, so far. They've been great neighbors. We look forward not only to their continued success, but their eventual expansion to neighboring properties. We've had Commissioner Cox from DPD come down and he was quite amazed at what they've been able to do with the space. 
that they have currently, which I believe was a hundred year old tanning facility, um, but they've now turned it into something for the 21st century. Um, truly remarkable for what they've done. Um, I would ask this committee's favorable consideration on this matter and would gladly turn it over to Eric if he'd like to explain it more or chairman, if you have any, yeah. I think that's sufficient. Well, let's, let's ask uh, any of the, any members of the committee if they've got any questions or comments. Okay, uh, hearing none, I just have a comment. Uh, are you gonna subscribe to this art therapy yourself, Raymond? Or what are you gonna do? Are you gonna be in line with the, with this? I, Chairman, if, if you're saying I need art therapy to become a better alderman, so be well, it. Well, you know, the art of politics is, is what it is, sir. And uh, I'll, uh, I'll be behind you uh, if you decide to go, okay? So I don't know, if you wanna give a couple of, a couple of uh, minutes to the uh, Bridgewater studio person, yes, if you want to say a few words. If Eric's available. I'm here, yeah. All right, so you got a couple customers, Eric, already. So. <laughs> well, Chairman, thank you for hearing us. Um, we are very excited to be part of the community and uh, grow our business in the city of Chicago. Um, it was a very um, wonderful uh, thing to receive the NOF funding and have the opportunity to engage the community. Um, we work with After School Matters doing mentorship programs as well as um, hiring locally from the community as well as Jane Adams Resource um, and uh, the Serco um, is where we find uh, a lot of our employees. So, um, you know, I ask for everyone's support in this um, in this matter. It's something that we're very passionate about and that we're very optimistic about being able to grow. Thank you very much. It's, it sounds like an a exciting project and also congrats on the NOF funding. Um, it's uh, a win-win, so to speak, for the community and for our city. Um, I don't, questions, comments? I don't see any. So can I get a motion to move to pass by the same roll call that was used to determine quorum? So we don't know moves. moves. Um, I think I saw Raymond. Raymond, do I you want to make that motion? Okay, so Alderman, Lop Alderman Lopez moves to pass. Any objections to his motion? Hearing none, uh, the item is passed. Congratulations. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Bottom of page five. Um, we're in the 17th ward on application number 20567. The ordinance was referred on December 16th of 2020. This common address, 6430 South Richmond Street, and the change request RS3 residential single unit detached house to an RT4 residential two flat townhouse and multi unit district. I think we have Michael Shirley on the call, I believe, to discuss this. Yes, sir. Okay, Michael. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, my business partner and I purchased this property approximately four months ago. Um, our intention is to convert the basement uh, into two uh, additional dwelling units, um, in addition to the two already existing there. Um, there are currently four uh, parking spaces uh, at this property, and um, we're, we're trying to make sure we go through the appropriate um, procedures to make, make the units uh, legal and certainly getting the appropriate appropriate permits to um, make the, the necessary conversions to that, that space in the basement. And um, you do, have, have you talked to Alderman David Moore? And I think we have a letter of support. Is David on the call? Yeah. Yes, I am. All yes, right. I am. Thank you, Chairman and I. David. And I yeah. My team and I, we went over there with our, as we do and could do conversion on these properties. One of the things we're looking at is just making sure a lot of these buildings are um, keeping up with what they already have and that they're good neighbors. And, and they definitely are one of those good neighbors that add value to the community. So this is definitely something I support and, and like the favorable um, vote from um, my colleagues on this in zoning. Thank you, David. Questions for the alderman or the applicant? Hearing none, can I get a motion moved to pass by the same roll call that was used to determine quorum? Cardona moves. Alderman Cardona moves to pass. Any objections to his motion? Hearing none, the items passed. Thank you. All right, we're gonna go to the top of page six. All right, and this is gonna be an item that we're gonna defer, but let me read it into the record. 
Document number 20564, 25th Ward, ordinance was referred on December 16th of 2020. Common addresses, 1930 through 2050 South Jefferson Street, 1927 through 2051 South Displain Street, 2020 through 2050 South Displain Street, 2037 through 2051 South Rubel Street, and 563 through 571 West Cullerton Street. And that change request was plan development number 1123, the B23 Neighborhood Shopping District. Um, uh, this is going to be deferred by the, um, Tyler? Are you? Alderman. Okay. Correct, Your Honor. Well, who's deferring it? Uh, Alderman uh, Cicho Lopez. Okay, so it's gonna be deferred by Alderman Cicho Lopez. Uh, can I get a motion to defer this item by the same roll call that was used to determine quorum? Cardona moves. Alderman Cardona moves uh, that uh, deferral. Any objections? Hearing none, the item is deferred. All right. Um, I got, I have to move back to, let me see. We have just a bit of housekeeping uh, back to page two, uh, this is document number 20494 T147 Ward. Uh, ordinance was referred on September 9th of 2020. And again, for members of the committee, this was the item on 1800 through 1808 West Berenice Avenue and 3834 through 44 North Ravenswood. So I'm gonna recognize Alderman Martin. I know we did pass it out of committee but I think you wanted to, uh, I know you you wanted to comment on it. I think you have a covenant that you wanna be read into the record. Yeah, very briefly. Thank you very much, Chairman, and uh, to members of the committee, my sincere thanks for your earlier vote. Um, one of the things that we were working with this particular applicant on concerned affordability, um, they uh, were willing to go significantly above the four units that were uh, ARO required um, on site. So we'll be doing eight units. That's reflected in a restrictive covenant that I wanted to ensure the record reflected. So again, my thanks to you all uh, for your support Great. earlier. And thank you, Chairman, for thank this opportunity. You. Thank you, Alderman. We do not need to have a vote on that. We just will have it in the record, okay? All right. Then now we're going to be bottom of page six. Okay, bottom of page six, document number 20587, 43rd Ward. Ordinance was referred on December 16th of 2020. Common address 735 through 737 West Wrightwood Avenue. And the change request, a B12 neighborhood shopping district to a B13 neighborhood shopping district. Tyler, uh, you wanna take, take stage, sir? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Tyler Manick of Shane Banks, Kenyon Schwartz. I'm here on behalf of the applicant NY2 LLC, which owns the subject property at 735 to 737 West Wrightwood. The subject property is improved with a three-story mixed-use building and an adjoining single-story commercial building. The applicant seeks a zoning map amendment from a B12 to a B13 zoning district in order to add two dwelling units and two stories to the one-story commercial space. The existing three-story building that has two residential units over commercial space is the remain as existing. We have provided the zone, since filing this application, we provided the zoning department with type one plans and a type one narrative in order to convert this application to a type one zoning map amendment. Uh, with that, I respectfully request that the committee uh, amend this application to a type one uh, zoning map amendment with the plans and narrative included. So Alderman uh, Kerry Austin moves to amend the application to a type one by the same roll call that was used to determine quorum. Any objections to her motion? Hearing none, the uh, this item is now amended to a type one application. All right. Prior to, filing this, prior to filing this application, the applicant met with Alderman Smith and the Park West Community Association. And the Alderman has kindly provided her letter of support. Therefore, I respectfully request this committee's favorable support to approve this zoning map amendment as amended to a type one, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Questions, uh, we do have a letter of support from Alderman Michelle Smith. Any questions for, for uh, the applicant? 
Hearing none, can I get a motion to move uh, the app this app this type one application forward with the same roll call that was used to determine quorum? Cardona moves. Alderman Cardona moves uh, uh, on the motion. Any objections? Hearing none, the item is amended to a type one application and passed as a type one amendment. Thank you. All right. Um, now we're on to page seven, top of page seven. Document number 20583 T1, 47th Ward. Ordinance was referred on December 16th of 2020. Common address 3437 North Polina Street and the change request. RS3 residential single unit detached house district to an RM5 residential multi-unit district. Tyler, uh, proceed on this, uh, this Polina application. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Once again, for the record, my name is Tyler Manick of Shane Banks, Kenyon Schwartz. I represent the owner of 3437 North Polina, Semco Realty Group, LLC. The subject property is improved with an existing three unit front building and an existing two unit coach house in the rear. The applicant seeks a zoning map amendment from an RS3 zoning district to an RM5 zoning district in order to add a garden apartment in the vacant existing garden level at the front building for a total of six dwelling units in this property. There will be no changes to the existing buildings and all work sought to be accomplished under the zoning map amendment in the front building will be interior. Prior to filing this application, the owner and I met with the alderman, his zoning advisory council, and shared these plans with West Lakeview neighbors. Uh, and I believe the alderman has provide, provided this committee with his letter of support. With the support of the alderman, I res respectfully request the, this committee's favorable recommendation, and I would have, be happy to answer any questions. We do have a letter of support from Alderman Martin. Um, is he still on the call? All right. Okay, we do have a letter of support for it. Anyways, uh, do I have questions from committee members? Hearing no questions, can I get a motion to move to pass by the same roll call that was used to determine quorum? Cardona, so moves. Alderman Cardona moves, uh, do pass. Any objections to the motion? Hearing none, the items passed. Thank you, Tyler. Uh, now we're middle of page seven. Document number 20566, 26th Ward. Ordinance was referred on December 16th of 2020. Common address, 1000 through 1002 North California Avenue. And the change request, B32, Community Shopping District to a C12, Neighborhood Commercial District. Dean Maragas. Morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the Honorable Committee. My name is Dean T. Maragas of the law firm of Maragas and Maragas here in Chicago at 1 North LaSalle. The purpose of this uh, matter is to establish a tavern on the ground floor and seek a variation for public place of amusement for the live entertainment within 125 feet of an RS3 zone. We've worked with the community and have received, we are aware of no opposition to this uh, zoning change. And we have received on November 30th, a letter from Alderman Maldonado in whose ward this is located stating that he supports the zoning change. Uh, we will gladly answer any questions of the committee. Mm -hmm. We do have a letter of support from Alderman Maldonado. Any questions from committee members? No questions, so moved by Alderman David okay. Moore. Well, before I get that motion, I wanted to uh, ask Dean, uh, that name Battaglia seems pretty uh, infamous in Chicago. Uh, is this an operator with other establishments in the city? Uh, he has been an excellent operator throughout the city. I've had the honor of representing him for 10 years and every project he's had, Ms., uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, has been a benefit to the community. Uh, we've received from every alderman that we've worked with letters of support for his projects. Uh, Battaglia is uh, a common name and uh, similar to any other name, it, there may be individuals who have that name. Uh, okay, great. All right, I see uh, alderman Mike Rodriguez, his hand is up. Mike? Oh, I'm sorry. That was an accident, Chair. But I, I did want to comment on the amazing um, shirt-sweater uh, combination there, Dean. Looking good, buddy. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right. Then we have uh, Alderman David Moore moves uh, 
moves on this item by the same roll call that was used to determine quorum. Any objection to Alderman Moore's uh, recommendation? Hearing none, the item's passed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I expect the fireside, uh, the next one, you know, <laughs> in the background. No problem. All right, Dean. Thank Take you. Care. Have a good one. All right, bottom of page seven. Document number 20580, 27th Ward. Ordinance was referred on December 16th of 2020. This common address, 3323 to 3369 West Grand Avenue. And the change request, B23 Neighborhood Shopping District to an M11 Limited Manufacturing District. And we have Jack Perino, I believe, on this um, application. Actually, oh, Katrina McGuire. You're not, you're not Jack. No, I am not Jack. Jack All right. one of my partners, but I am filling in for him. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Um, identify really yourself. Briefly, please. I got uh, thrown off uh, the as a panelist so quickly by Bennett last time. I just did want to uh, extend the development team's gratitude to this uh, committee and especially to Alderman Burnett for his support of our project in the Halstead Triangle. It's greatly appreciated. Great. So moving on to this one. Uh, again, Katrina McGuire from Thompson uh, Coburn offices at 55 East Monroe here on behalf of the applicant seeking to rezone the site to a M11 limited manufacturing district for the purpose of developing it with a car wash. Um, that is as simple um, of a request as I can think of from that standpoint, from a zoning standpoint. Uh, we understand that Alderman Burnett is supportive of this project and I'm hopeful he is still on the Zoom. Okay, Alderman Burnett. Oh, are you talking to me? Yeah. Yes, sir. We're okay, talking about moment. Grand Avenue, 3323, the car wash. Oh, I'm I'm in uh, full support of it. Okay. Uh, I think it's great. I, I need you to give me a call later on, uh, McGuire. Okay. Sounds good, Alderman. All right. Thank All you. right, but you but you're in you're in support of this application. So, any yes, questions for the applicant or the alderman? Hearing no questions, can I get a motion moved to pass by the same roll call that was used to determine quorum? Cardona motion. Alvin, Alvin Cardona, you're, you're my uh, pullback today, moves to pass. Any objections to his motion? Hearing none, the item is passed. Felix, you know, I didn't call you your halfback. You're, 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 you're the fullback. You're right in the middle, right there. All right. All right. Practicing you, for Jeopardy. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Yeah. <laughs> All right, thanks, Katrina. All right, top of page eight. Document number 20570 in the 29th Ward. Ordinance was referred on December 16th of 2020. Common address 207 through 209 North Parkside Avenue and the change request. RS3, residential single unit detached house to an RT4, residential two flat townhouse and multi-unit district. We have Mr. Moore, Tom Moore. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name for the record is Thomas S. Moore, and uh, this is a current six flat on a huge lot uh, that has a uh, lot of space that could fit two more units. And um, the uh, owner went and talked to the alderman and um, said that he would like to add those units and make because they would not be in a formal affordable program, but they would be more affordable than market. And uh, the alderman uh, supported it. You have a letter in support and we'd request your support as well. We do have a letter of support from Alderman Telefiero. Uh, questions for the applicant or anyone else? All right. So no questions, committee members, do I have a motion to move to pass? So moved, same, Mr. Same Chairman, vote. Alderman Austin. That was Alderman Kerry Austin moves to pass. Um, any objections to her motion? Hearing none, the item is passed. Now we're moving to the middle of page eight. Document number 20568, 31st Ward. Ordinance was referred on December 16th of 2020. Common address, 4830 West Diversity Avenue and 2820 North Cicero Avenue. Change request, B11 Neighborhood Shopping District to a B31 Community Shopping District. 
Again, we have uh, Tom Moore. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is a existing building. There'll be no changes to the exterior of the building. Uh, it's next to a, a central um, a food mart, and this building is now empty. Um, the plan is to put a um, state-of-the-art washers and dryers um, in the zoning classification. It calls it a coin-operated uh, washing washing center, but in fact, um, now they don't use coins anymore. They use a, some sort of uh, uh, clicker card. Um, but um, so this is purely a matter of use. A B1 does not allow the coin operated use and uh, the B3 would. So to fill this empty uh, building with a uh, viable use that is needed in the neighborhood, we did have a uh, meeting with the alderman and his zoning committee and they agreed that um, there was not uh, one of these, especially a newer one, uh, state of the art one in the area and uh, the alderman issued his letter of support after that meeting and we'd request your support as well. Uh, we do have a letter of support from uh, Alderman Cardona and I know he's on the call. No, Felix, do you I don't think say it was it? Alderman Cardona. It's all, oh, I'm sorry, excuse me. Yes, <laughs> excuse me. Okay, so I think it is Cardona. It uh, is. F Felix, you wanna say a few yes, Another job opportunity for your work, you. it sounds like? <laughs> yes. Thank you, Chairman, members of the committee. Um, uh, the owner of the, pro uh, of the property basically um, started doing things around there, rehabilitating the, the corner of Central Foods, uh, which opened up a year and a half ago. Now this we have this vacant uh, space that we're gonna bring a laundromat um, with a card. Um, there's no laundromat uh, near in sight, so it's gonna benefit the, the neighborhood itself. Also, it's gonna bring jobs and again, it's, it's a small business coming into the community. And especially uh, during these times, we want to revitalize uh, uh, the, the economy, but also revitalize our community as well. And I'm in full support of this. And thank you for your favorable consideration. Uh, questions for the alderman and the applicant? Hearing none, can I get a motion? To move so moved by Viegas. Alderman Viegas moves to pass by the same roll call that was used to determine quorum. Any objections to his motion? Hearing none, the item is passed. All right, bottom of page eight. Document number 20569, 32nd Ward. Ordinance was referred on December 16th of 2020. Common address 3056 North Racine Avenue. And the change request from an RT4 residential two flat townhouse and multi-unit district to a B11 neighborhood shopping district. Mr. Moore. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this is a kind of iconic um, old building with the classic with the uh, house up, the apartment up above and the Ma and Pa shop uh, on the ground floor. At some time in the past, it was, uh, rezoned into an R4, uh, and the uh, some years ago the existing business moved out of the first floor, and now uh, the owner, um, uh, who is a uh, older lady who uh, derives her income from uh, the apartment upstairs and the would-be commercial business downstairs, uh, is looking for a new tenant but no tenant could get a, a city business license in an R4. So this is merely to change the building to the zoning to reflect what is there uh, that will allow a business to move in and get a, um, a uh, business license. We had both a community meeting and we met with the alderman and you have a letter of support from Alderman Wagasback and we'd request your support as well. Do have a letter of support from Alderman Wagasback. I don't know, Scott, are you on the call? Yep, right here, Chairman. All right, let's talk about Racine. Okay, uh, this I think you know is the former pantry. It's had a few names. It's right across the street from your ward there on Racine. We worked with the Lakeview Neighborhood Group, the South Lakeview Neighbors, and uh, Tom Moore to get this one 
uh, set up for the pr appropriate zoning change and um, for the purposes of keeping that business going and keeping uh, you know a viable business in there whenever we can uh, we'd like to make this change so I would just appreciate the committee support uh, for purposes of planning here great um, questions for the alderman or the applicant hearing none can I get a motion move to pass by the same roll call that was used to determine form no move that was uh, my halfback. That's uh, <laughs> Vice Chair Raboyas on that one. Uh, who, who grew up right down the street, I think. Yeah. That's right. That's that was right. Your ped that was the peddling corner, I think, uh, wasn't it, Ariel? I think? No, it wasn't. Oh, I know which one was. It was the candy store for him. Yeah. All right, buddy. Okay. Uh, so thank you, Chairman. Alderman uh, uh, Raboyas moves uh, do pass by the same roll call that was used to determine quorum. Any objections to the motion? Hearing none, the item is passed, and uh, compliments to you, Scott. I hope we can get a nice tenant on that corner. Thank you, Chairman. Okay. Thank, Thank you, Tom. Much. All right, now we're on middle of page nine, uh, number, document number 20588, 47th Ward. Ordinance was referred on December 16th of 2020. Common address is 2145 West Montrose, also 4631 North Lincoln Avenue. Change request B12 neighborhood shopping district to a B13 neighborhood shopping district. Uh, let me try to get this right. Uh, Talar uh, Berberian, please uh, identify yourself for the record because I'm sorry. I hope I didn't uh, mispronounce your name too much. Uh, good, good afternoon, um, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, just barely. Um, yes, my name is Talar Berberian from Thompson Coburn. Uh, with offices at 55 East Monroe, and I'm here representing the Condo Association for 2139 West Montrose. Um, the president of the Condo Association should also be present, but um, you know, if there are questions at the end for her, we can address those as necessary. Um, we're here today to request the rezoning of a five-unit condo building at 2145 West Montrose, it has an alternative frontage at 4361 North Lincoln. And um, we're seeking a rezoning from the current B12 designation to the proposed B13. That is in order to legalize the existing FAR that's on site. Um, the building's unit count and parking condition are legal nonconformities. Uh, that's been confirmed by the Department of Planning. And uh, so it's just the FAR that we're here to, to legalize. It's, a, it's an existing condition. Um, we did meet with the North Center neighbors about this proposal. Uh, we also have a letter of support on file from Alderman Martin's office, and um, we're happy to answer any questions that there might be on this project. We do have a letter of support from Alderman Martin, um, and it sounds like there's no changes to the footprint or the building. Is that correct? That's correct. No changes are proposed. Okay. All right. Uh, questions from committee members? Can I get a motion to move to pass by the same roll call that was used move to, to pass, form? Chairman. That was uh, Chairman Dow moves to pass. Any objections to our motion? Hearing none, the item is passed. Thank you. And thanks Thank for your you. patience, especially our resident over there, um, my neighbor in 47. All right, uh, bottom of page nine, document number 20563. T1, 47th Ward, ordinance was referred on December 16th of 2020. Common address, 4040 through 4048 North Hermitage Avenue. And the change request from an RM 5.5 residential multi-unit district to an RM 5.5 residential multi-unit district. So what are we doing here? All right, well, let's see what Walter has. To, uh, Warren, Warren, let's talk about this one, please. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Um, for the record, I'm Warren Silver, Silver Law Office PC, uh, representing 4046 Hermitage LLC on this beautiful day for a remote meeting pandemic or no. Um, uh, the building is zoned RM 5.5, but it's subject to a type one rezoning plan. Uh, we're seeking at this time to amend that type one rezoning plan uh, to provide uh, the prior plan called for, I believe, 12 dwelling units. This one is uh, going to provide for 19 dwelling units and 19 parking spaces. Uh, the prior developers 
uh, plans fell through um, and our client uh, acquired the site. Um, uh, the rezoning plan uh, takes in slightly less property uh, because the, the development site is now uh, a rectangle with uh, 100 feet frontage and 165 foot uh, lot depth. Um, there is a, a unique twist to this. Um, in addition to providing um, the two affordable uh, units required by the affordable requirements ordinance, the developer is providing two additional units. And furthermore, there are three units on the first floor um, that are uh, going to be constructed as accessible units. And uh, the developers uh, entered into an agreement with Access Living to identify uh, and refer uh, disabled people who are eligible for the affordable housing uh, to uh, be aware of the units when they become vacant. Uh, there's a, a covenant that will be recorded. Um, I believe that Alderman Martin has uh, submitted a copy of that covenant for the record, as well as his letter of support. Uh, we did go through extensive community process uh, as Alderman Martin uh, typically requires uh, with the Zoning Advisory Committee um, and a virtual community meeting sponsored by the Alderman's office. Um, it, at this time, we've, uh, as I said, we've received Alderman Martin's support and we request the committee's favor nomination as well. Uh, we, do have, we do have a letter of support from Alderman Martin. Questions from committee members? Um, I have a quick one, uh, Warren. Just to mm -hmm. summarize, the original development had how many units the, and before it became a T1? Okay. So originally, this was a screw factory um, that had been vacant for many, many years. Um, it has been through several development proposals that have fallen through. Um, the most recent one, um, which is uh, memorialized in the current uh, type one rezoning plan um, uh, called for, uh, I believe it was uh, 12 units and 24 parking spaces. Um, the developer wasn't able to complete that development. Um, and, uh, our, you know, our client acquired right. the site and uh, submitted a plan with 19 units, right. Right. 19 parking spaces. Right. So, but the 12 units, 24 parking spaces would have been done under the current RM 5.5 well, historically. That, that party had rezoned the site to RM 5.5. For the for the twelve units and twenty four parking under their yeah right under okay. their right okay. so we're going to keep it at RM five point five but with an amendment to the development plan great that's what I needed to hear okay. all right any other any questions comments we do have a letter of support from Alderman Martin um, can I get a motion to move to pass by the same roll call that was used to determine quorum so move Cardona Alderman Cardona moves to pass any objections to his motion. Hearing none, the item is passed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All, All right. Nice. Top of page 10, 50th Ward, document number 20561. The ordinance was referred on December 16th of 2020. Common address, 2620 West Tui Avenue. And the change request from an RS3 residential single unit detached house district and a B31 community shopping district, all to a B31 community shopping district. Uh, we have Mark Nava. Mr. Nora. Chairman. Nora, I'm sorry. It's Nora. Yeah, it's got Nava and Nova on it. Well, but whatever. It's, really it's, Nora, Nora, it's Nora, Nora now. Okay. All right. Proceed. Good, good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Mark Nora. I'm with the law firm of Pulsinelli at 150 North Riverside Plaza in Chicago. We represent Hebrew Theological College, which is the applicant for this request which will, uh, is for the purpose of taking a presently vacant former grammar school and religious center and to permit the operation of a full-time all-day uh, seminary college uh, leading to a degree program and uh, 
that's the nuts and bolts. There are no changes to the physical exterior of the building. Uh, it is consistent. This change would be consistent with the entire zoning classification for the north side of the block. Um, and uh, we ask, you did meet with the Alderman, Alderman Silverstein, back on October 6th of this year, and we received favorable consideration. And we ask your, we respectfully ask for the committee's right. approval today. Uh, we do have a letter of support from Alderman Silverstein. Uh, do we have any questions from committee members? Hearing none, can I get a motion? So move, Cardona. All right, uh, Alderman Cardona moves to pass by the same roll call that was used to determine quorum. Any objections to his motion? All right. Hearing none, I think that was, yeah. All right, hearing none, the yes. item is passed. All right, thank you and good luck to you, sir. Thank right. you, Mr. Chairman, thank you. <laughs> All right, so, With middle please. of page, middle of page 10. Okay, middle of page 10, document number 20541, third ward, ordinance was referred on November 16th of 2020. Common address 319 through 331 East 43rd Street and 4300 through 4318 South Calumet Avenue and the change request from an RM5 residential multi-unit district to B23 neighborhood mixed use district and then into the residential plan development. Scott Bornstein. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? We can proceed. Great, thank you, members of the committee. Scott Borstein from the Law Offices of Neil and Leroy here on behalf of 43 Green uh, JV LLC, which is a, a partnership between the Habitat Company and uh, P3 Markets. Um, this is a project that um, we've been working on for some time. And uh, I'll just to begin with, it was a, it's a plan development application. And we did proceed before the uh, planning commission earlier this month. So I would request that all the findings and records from that hearing be incorporated into the hearing today. So Alderman um, Kerry Austin moves to incorporate the records from the plan commission by the same roll call that was used to determine quorum. Any objections to our motion? Hearing none, the records are incorporated. Uh, proceed. Thank you. Um, so I, we've got a, a, a team of people and I'm gonna turn it over to them. We had a slide presentation from the plan commission hearing and we have it here today and our, uh, our folks will go over it very quickly understanding that we, we have time pressures. Before I just do that though, I know Alderman Dowell is here and we wanna thank her of course for her uh, uh, critical support in the project. And I don't know if she wants to speak before we do our presentation or after, but obviously we'd like to hear uh, hear her confirm her support. We're gonna hear from Alderman Dowell, but Scott, I don't think we have um, slides. No, uh, I, I sent them to, to Ray, but um, it's, I guess we, it, we can certainly proceed. It's a, it's a 99 unit project. Uh, it's 10 stories. It's 50% of it is affordable. Um, and 50% is market rate. It's got ground floor retail. Um, it is really, does, it's a TOD project and it's really designed to jumpstart uh, this area at 43rd and Calumet. Um, it's an area that just hasn't had any development for a long time. And uh, I know the team is incredibly proud to bring the project forward. And I know the neighbors are very excited and I know Alderman Dow can uh, can uh, confirm that, but uh, I, I think there's other people from our team here. If there are any other questions, but um, yeah. no, I, uh, I I was on the plan commission. It's a very exciting project. I know that the uh, principals there with Habitat have uh, been involved with that community for many, many, many decades, and I know they did some powerful testimony at plan commission. Uh, but uh, if there's while we do this, Scott, uh, why don't we, if, if we're done, we can ask Alderman Dowell. And then if, if you do have uh, either a person from Habitat or the other uh, partner that would like to say a few words about how exciting this is and a catalyst for uh, the area. But uh, shall, we, shall we move to Alderman Dowell? 
Hi, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, members of the zoning committee. I ask for your support for this project, which passed the plan commission earlier this month. As Scott said, this is the first transit oriented development project along the south leg of the Green Line and uh, along 43rd Street, uh, where we have seen very little um, uh, investment. We are excited about this project because this will be a catalyst for other development along 43rd Street. Uh, this project sits between uh, uh, the L station at 43rd Street and the Hydea Pendleton Park. Um, I'm very pleased with the joint venture development uh, partnership between uh, P3 Markets and the Habitat Company. And I wanna thank Phil Beckham, Jeff Head, Charlton Hamer, Scott Bornstein, and all the rest of the team um, for their uh, commitment to this development, which will be constructed by Boer Boa Construction, who is the general contractor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right. Um, we want to hear, Scott, is there one or two of your witnesses that would just like to opine a little bit on it? Um, I, I think if Phil Beckham is. Uh, yeah, that, I think he was the one that spoke at Plan Commission, but I'm not. Yeah, sure. I think it'd be worthwhile to have here, you know, just from him briefly, and then we can move on, I think. Okay. Do we have Good afternoon. Again? Okay. Could you identify yourself for the record, sir? Yes. Uh, my name is Philip Beckham. Uh, I am a principal uh, of P3 Markets, a real estate development firm, along with my uh, partner, Juan Saldana. We are a uh, black and brown uh, development firm based in Brownsville. And once again, uh, Mr. Chair and committee members, I do uh, thank you for taking this time. Uh, this project is not just a development. It is personal. This is my neighborhood from my father to my grandfather, and it is also uh, personal to the community and neighbors. Everything that this project uh, it, it entails is something that uh, the community has been talking about and wanting for you know over 10 years of, of meetings, uh, block club meetings and block parties. So uh, it's exciting to, to re, uh, reignite a dead uh, uh, retail uh, corridor with three uh, black owned businesses and one is a national brand. Uh, and also uh, a great to repopulate an area that has no population uh, and we've been losing population and we're marketing towards young professionals to bring that uh, energy back. Uh, once again, this is more than just a project for me, it's personal uh, and it is also personal for our community. And I thank Alderman Dow uh, and, and for all her efforts and, uh, and my par our partner, our JV partner Habitat for uh, helping push, pull this through. So Great. thank you very much to the uh, Mr. Chair and the committee. Thank you for your uh, commitment to our city and perseverance. Uh, I think we have uh, Alderman Osterman has a question. Harry? Yes. Um, one is if we if um, we can get the renderings, I'd like to see that not now, but at some point in time. I think um, uh, I've got confidence in Alderman Dahl that this is a great project and. Um, as Mr. Beckham said, if there's ways that this could be a catalyst for other parts of the South and West Side that um, could use that jump start, I think uh, would love to see it. Um, I want to congratulate all the Mandal, uh, Mr. Beckham, and all the partners on the team. You guys have a, a phenomenal leader and her um, that can make this happen. Uh, one question though relates to um, on the the 5050 affordable and market rate. Um, are there government subsidies um, that are going to go to help pay for the affordable side of it? Go ahead, Scott. Phil, you want to go ahead? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so this is, um, we did uh, apply and, and were awarded the 9% uh, uh, tax credits, uh, low, low income housing tax credits. Uh, and uh, we were also um, awarded uh, a state grant uh, for the uh, affordable housing uh, through Senator Maddie Hunter, uh, and we are um, uh, putting in a request for TIF. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you. I think if yeah. there's a way through the committee to get some of the, right. the renderings on us, I'd appreciate right. it. But Alderman Dahl, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Osterman. The architect on this project is Landon Baum. Okay. So, Scott, according to my office, the link is, is not working from you. So you'll have to send the attachments so that we can send them to our committee members. 
Oh, okay. Uh, do you want do you want me to try to do that right now or? Whenever you can. Yep. We okay. do have another. We do have another, another um, question from question. from Alderman Sophia, Sophia King. King. Alderman King. Yeah. Yes. yes. Chairman, Chairman um, um, not so much as a question, but a statement. I just wanted to uh, take a moment and congratulate my colleague, Alderman Dow. Um, we share borders. And so, you know, we're looking forward to this. I've uh, went to a couple of community meetings about this particular project. I know uh, Phil Beckham to be a great uh, community me uh, member who is very active in the community. Um, so, you know, I'm prideful to see him uh, be uh, a part of this particular project. I think it will be great for both of our communities, for a community which we share actually. And so, Alderman Dow, continue uh, to appreciate all that you do uh, for your constituents and, and by virtue of sharing a border, mine as well. So uh, thank you again and thank you, Chairman, for allowing me to speak. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. And again, Scott, we'll work it out with the committee to make sure that we can get that. I guess the files might be too big. Um, yeah, no problem. We'll, we, we will send a, a PDF or some way that you can have the file, certainly. Okay. All right, because it, right. it is a um, handsome, project, handsome project. And as uh, Chairman Dow said, I believe it's one of the first TODs on this, on, in your neighborhood, right, Chairman Dow? That's accurate. Scott, can you just send the, the just one slide over to Nicole so she can show it if uh, all right, maybe after the next one, if the chairman will allow it. Okay. Well, all right. We're going to be on the lookout and we will come back to it just so that uh, our committee sees the handsome project that it is. Okay, right. we'll try to get that done. Okay. All right, any other questions, comments? If not, can I get a motion move to pass? Motion to pass, Cardona. Alderman, Alderman Raboyas uh, makes motion to pass uh, by the same roll call that was used to determine quorum. Any objections to that motion? Hearing none, this item is passed as revised. And again, if we can get something quickly, I can, just for the, I can come back to it. In, Okay, we will, we'll try. Okay, all right. Now we're on the bottom of page 10. Document number 20543, 27th Ward. Ordinance was referred on November 16th of 2020. Common address, 311 through 315 North Sangamon and 901 through 925 West Wayman Street and then 310 through 314 North Peoria Street. This change request is from a DX3 downtown mixed use district and the C11 neighborhood commercial district, all to a BX5 downtown mixed use district and then to business plan development. Um, Mike Esker, Mike. Good afternoon, Chairman Tunney, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Michael Esger and I'm a partner at the law firm of Acosta Esger. And this matter was uh, approved at the plan commission at the January 21st Plan Commission hearing. So as a preliminary matter, I'd like to respectfully request that the records of that proceeding be incorporated into today's hearing. Okay, so Alderman uh, Raboyas uh, moves to pass to accept the, the plans from the Plan Commission by the same roll call that was used to determine quorum. Any, oh. obje any objections to that? Hearing none, does that carry? Did you make the motion? Raboyas did. Raboyas, I thought I heard Kerry speak up too. All right, so uh, the records are now, in, hearing no objections, the records are now incorporated. Mike? Thank Mike. you very much. Uh, the second housekeeping matter is that I, uh, working with DPD, we discovered a typo in the ordinance. And so uh, respectfully request a, the substitute ordinance that I have on file with DPD to be uh, a, a approved to move forward on that substitute ordinance. All right, Anna from the department, are you on the call for this? Uh, Change. Noah, Noah would be aware of it if he's on the call. I'm not sure. Okay. Yes, Chairman, I am on the call. I'm okay. looking at the um, Chicago Plan Commission passage to see the. Yeah, it, I do have the substitute ordinance. 
And what is the nature of the, of the, there was a typo that Mr. Esger said was. Was it in the boundary? No, no, the, it actually said DX7 instead of DX5. I'll confirm which that. Which we're, right we're, we're requesting a DX5, and I, we've been approved more as a DX5, of course. Okay. So we have it on, on, our, on our agenda as a DX5. Correct. Okay. All right. So I'm going to ask Alderman Raboyas to accept the substitute by the same roll call that was used to determine quorum. Any objections to that? Hearing none, the substitute is accepted. All right, Anna, if you Thank want you, to, Mark. if you want to get back to us, I think I think we're we're using the lesser zoning, so I think. Yeah, I see the original was the DX seven, and the substitute is the DX five, the final. Okay. All right, so we've accepted that substitute, um, and we're moving forward. Thank All you. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So uh, with that, maybe we should move to the presentation. I can walk through quickly the project uh, that was approved last week, um, not only at the Plan Commission, but previously at the Historic Preservation Permit Review Committee. Uh, there's two buildings here. The one that we're looking at here is at 310 North Peoria, and it is a historic building. It's a, it's a contributing building to the landmark, and it was previously approved uh, before this committee and PRC with a fifth floor addition, which we are including in the new project. And then if we go to the next slide, believe it or not, this building is not a contributing building in the historic district, but it is in the district. And so we're proposing to demolish this. And um, again, both buildings join together for a 296 key hotel. And if we go to the next slide, um, you can see the progression. We work closely with historic preservation and the community uh, starting back in February and worked on massing, height, uh, materials, design, and uh, significant improvement to, I think, what you'll see here in the current design, which is a 14-story uh, building. And um, if we go to the next slide, you can see the images from the south elevation, what you'd experience from Fulton Street. Again, that same uh, design progression to where we are in the bottom right corner is what's been approved uh, so far. And if we go to the next slide, we um, a number of site plan improvements that we worked out with CDOT. This area is transitioning. There's a lot of improvements that CDOT has already done. And this project contributes to some of those site uh, improvements, including bumped out sidewalks on both ends, bicycle parking, um, reusing existing loading uh, zones so that we um, have appropriate loading and uh, for the hotel and for uh, deliveries, uh, as well as some really nice improvements to landscaping. And finally, infrastructure improvements, not only at the corner of Fulton and Peoria with four-way stop that we'll be um, including in our construction, but also uh, striping and more stop signs on the corner of Peoria and Wayman. And um, the next slide, is the approved project. This is the north elevation. You can see how the buildings sort of work together. And um, again, the north elevation. The next slide will show a close up of the ground level and the improvements to the streetscape there. It's the only building between Sangamon and Peoria on Wayman Street. And, um, and so a lot of effort went into not only the building and design, but the site plan. Here's another close up. You can see uh, this is intended to be open, active and uh, pedestrian experience, uh, significant improvement to the sidewalk landscaping. The next slide will show a close up of the uh, reworked historic building where we have uh, some outdoor seating proposed for the restaurant that would be uh, going here. And um, I think if we have, we may have one more slide. Uh, this shows it from Sangamon, the hotel entrance, and then the final uh, slide um, I think there's one more, maybe not. This is the final slide. So um, we, again, went through an com extensive community process. All, the community has uh, approved the project, and I believe Alderman Burnett is here. Uh, I uh, remain uh, available to answer any questions. Thank you. All right. Alderman Burnett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman uh, and members of the committee. Um, so this is a great project and what has been uh, 
worked on for about two years. They went, met with all of the local community organizations, West Loop Gate, West Central, and now uh, they actually uh, was approved uh, maybe a year ago, uh, but planning didn't like the uh, FAR or the, uh, I think the FAR, and they had them to restructure it. Uh, it turned out to be a much better project. Uh, appreciate everyone who worked on this. Uh, this is going to bring, um, I think, about 400 jobs to the community, about 200 temporary and about, you know, a little over 100 uh, permanent jobs. Um, the owner of this facility actually been around for a long time. Uh, he was partners in the Victor Hotel, which used to be a restaurant. Uh, it's good to see people uh, who have been in the community for a long time repping the benefits off of the progress of the community and that they're staying. He's not taking the money and running. He's staying in the community. We appreciate him. Uh, so everyone in the community support it. I support it. I ask for the committee support also. Thank All right. You. Thank you, Alderman. Questions for the applicant or the Alderman? I think we have Alderman Cardenas. Yeah, you know, uh, Chairman, I, uh, I'm i not on the committee. Uh, I'll, you know, I'll, obviously, uh, Chairman Burnett has done a tremendous job in Fulton Market. Um, yeah, I remember uh, I used to call it Victor Hotel. Many events went, went were there. Uh, very beloved, uh, beloved uh, site. I'm glad that it uh, it became a hotel in, in in you know in real life. So it's going to become a hotel in real life. I'm I, I'm excited. Just I love Fulton Market. Uh, maybe in, in redistricting uh, uh, on Walter, we can talk about how we can you know share some of that. Uh, you want to fight, man? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think you got the weights behind you, Walter. I think you've been praying there. All right. Um, other questions, comments. Uh, Mike or, or the alderman, is there parking in this thing or no? There is not any parking proposed. This is significantly TOD. It's about 530 feet from the uh, Morgan CTA. And okay. as well, the existing building is a landmark. So um, okay. there was no parking, but, yeah. but a lot of parking in the area, a lot of public parking in the area. Yeah, until parking. Walter gets done with it, there won't be much parking left. <laughs> 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 All right, let's hope the hotel business revives. Let's hope that. Yes, That's that true. would be the key. That is yeah. the key. All right, any other For questions all. or comments on this? Hearing none, can I get a motion to uh, to move this item by the last uh, roll call of the vote for quorum? Who's moving this one? Alderman Waggis back moves to pass. Alderman, Alderman Waggis back, back. Uh, uh, moves on the on ordinance. The ordinance as well I'll just say as revised and substituted and he, he's up, up here, here now uh i think alderman viegas first i'll okay. hold my motion if okay. you okay. like we'll hold, hold the motion, motion. Alderman alderman viegas. No, mr. no mr chairman uh, uh i was going to comment after uh, this pass okay so um so alderman wagas back renews his motion all those in favor aye any opposed aye any opposed? Okay. Hearing none, the item is passed as uh, revised and substituted. Now, um, is one thing, uh, Chairman Viegas, would you like to comment now on it? No, no uh, Mr. Chairman, I don't want to comment on this specific project. I, I just want to comment. Um, um, these are great. These are exciting projects and a lot of job creation. I wanted to know um, who, who, in the which department is responsible for monitoring uh, all the jobs that are created um, once these projects are approved? I know that uh, during the presentation, there was a lot of discussion about jobs created, uh, MWB participation, which is great. I'm just wondering who monitors that and how do we get a report back as to whether this is being actually attained um, throughout the course of the throughout the course of the construction project? Um, uh, Chairman, before I before I get in, uh, I want to say as a member of the Planning Commission, this com has come up repeatedly, and I believe uh, there's quarterly reports to the Plan Commission, and I'm assuming that they're shared with the Department of Planning and such. And um, I would I would hope that uh, upon demand we could get these on a quarterly basis. I think that's kind of where you want to go with this, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I think I think it I think it'd be um, if maybe at some point, Mr. Chairman, if 
the Department of Planning could present to the to the zoning committee as well. I mean, right. uh, we are approving these projects, and again, we 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 are uh, we know that the aldermen where these projects are going in are uh, challenging and, and pushing. We just want to make sure that there's some attainment going yeah. on and reporting back. Do not disagree. All right. Thank you, Chairman. I agree too. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Okay. Mark. Now, just quickly, I'm going to go back to the um, third ward. We do. We have received, um, I think, a couple of slides. Thank you, Michael. By the way. All right. What do we got here? This is it. Is there one or two? Unmute me. All right, Scott, you, can you see our screen here? I can, can you hear me? Yeah, so quickly, okay. I know we've already approved it, but uh, orient the uh, committee and uh, about this fine project here. Uh, oh, sure, you know, is is uh, Matt Snope, I think he was, he's our project architect who is, you know, imminently more familiar with all the de details Probably be better to have him just quickly run through it. Okay, quickly. We got. We still got a few more before the. Uh, um, before we can conclude. Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. I think um, if you can hear me now, I was promoted to speaker. Um, uh, thank you for taking the time to look at our project, and thanks for the uh, vote of approval already. What you're looking at here is uh, a 10-story building at the corner of 43rd and South Calumet. Um, it's adjacent to the Green Line. Um, at 43rd Street, it has 99 apartment units, including um, studios, one bedroom, and two bedroom units. You can see the, the massing from the image on the screen. It steps away from the train um, uh, intentionally to sort of uh, help mitigate the exposure to train noise. There is a common roof deck created on uh, atop of those setbacks at level seven. So there's a there's an outdoor roof deck that faces north and one that faces south. Um, and okay, we're going through the slides. Um, that's great. This is the this is a view of the building from 43rd Street. Um, it's uh, precast concrete construction. Um, again, their uh, two bedroom units are on the north and south corners of the site. You can see balconies at those units. Um, there's retail along 43rd Street. So an important aspect of the project is to promote. Um, uh, invigorate the existing retail corridor, corridor along 43rd. Um, this slide shows the um, proposed residential apartment entrance off South Calumet um, and the apartments above. Uh, last feature maybe to point out, there's a significant setback um, from the existing two-story uh, residential building south of us um, and we've created We've used that space to create an outdoor patio and uh, landscape terrace area. The um, surface parking lot is accessed off of the alley, so there's no curb cut on Calumet. Um, parking for 24 cars, uh, which is significantly reduced due to its um, location adjacent to the train line. So again, thank you very much. If there's any questions, I'm happy to respond. Thank you. Um, and I know that, as Chairman Dow said, this is providing a new stock of housing uh, for the neighborhood, which is more dense and under the TOD, smaller units to diversify your housing mix, I believe, on this one. So congratulations. All right. Thanks, Scott. Thank you again. Much appreciated. Okay. All right. Good luck. Now we're in the top of page 11. Document number 19927, 28th Ward. Ordinance was referred on January 23rd of 19. Common address is 1100 through 1118 Southwestern Avenue in the change request, C12 Neighborhood Shopping District through B23 Neighborhood Mixed Use District. I know we have Nick Fatikas. Oh, we have Daniel. Okay. All right. Just for the edification of the committee, uh, this was originally in front of us, but it was in the first ward. So expl explain where we're, how we're moving forward with this, because there's a time lapse here that's a little uh, extraordinary. Daniel? That's right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Daniel Box. I'm an attorney with the Law Offices of Sam Banks, located at 221 North LaSalle. Like Alderman Tunney had just shared with the committee, this 
this zoning change has actually been previously before uh, this committee. The exact same application uh, was before this committee uh, in early uh, 2019, at, at which time we had realized a typographical error with that application, mistakenly indicating that then Alderman Moreno uh, was the first ward was uh, the, the ward in which this property address was located. That, of course, was a mistake. This address is actually located in the 28th Ward. We, were, we corrected that mistake at the time we presented the application uh, before this esteemed committee, um, and the application was then uh, was then supported. It was then uh, 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 approved by this committee for ratification by City Council. When this application was then uh, moved for ratification by City Council, that typographical error was not corrected. Uh, and then Alderman Moreno, uh, of course, not recognizing this address, uh, decided to defer the agenda, this item at that time. It wasn't until uh, this applicant went forward with permitting and was actually subsequently denied uh, permitting that we realized what had happened at City Council, that the zoning map was never changed. And as such, we are just here today to rehear that application. It's the exact same application with no changes whatsoever that was previously ratified in uh, January or February of 2019. Daniel, just so we have the common address is 1100 through 1118 Southwestern Avenue. Was the typo, was it Northwestern Avenue versus Southwestern that was the problem or what? To be honest, I, I don't even think that there was a typographical error with the address. I think uh, our office just mistakenly identified the first ward as okay. the correct ward, uh, you know, we sometimes use the same templates uh, from previous application, and I'm assuming okay. that, that was just. I just know that 1100 North would be closer to the first ward than the 28. That's what I was thinking out loud. So, okay, well, we're here. We're here. So let's let's keep going. Great. Uh, well, just to reiterate what the the nature of the zoning change request, uh, the property is is still currently improved with a three with several buildings. One is a three story mixed use building, one is a one story commercial building. There's another one story garage, and there's also a surface parking lot. Uh, the applicant is seeking to raise the existing structure and to develop the subject property with two new buildings, uh, both four story, twenty one unit residential buildings. On-site garage parking for 21 vehicles in each building will be located at the rear of the lot. And in order to permit the project, the applicant is seeking a zoning change from a C12 neighborhood commercial district to a B23 neighborhood mixed use district. Our, alder uh, our office, just as it did with the application in 2019, has worked with the local community and with Alderman Irvin on this project. I believe that he has tendered a, a letter of support or an email of support to Nicole for this right. project. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. We have received a, a letter of support from Alderman Irvin. Questions from committee members? Hearing none, can I get a motion moved to pass by the same roll call that was used to determine quorum? So moved, Alderman Lopez. Alderman Ray Lopez uh, moves to pass. Any objections to the motion? Hearing none, the item is passed. Thank you, Dan. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Bottom of page 11, uh, document number 20510, 40th Ward. Ordinance was referred on September 9th of 2020. Common address 6300 North Ridge Avenue and 1925 West Tome Avenue. And the change request is plan development number 253 and RS3 residential single unit detached house district two plan development number 253 as amended and i think we have joe gattuso joe okay would you want to proceed on this project that i think was in front of plan commission right okay yeah good afternoon mr chairman members of the committee my name is joseph p gattuso of the law firm taft statinius and hollister llp 111 east wacker drive chicago illinois I am pleased to be here this afternoon on behalf of the applicant, Misericordia Home, which is seeking to expand its campus in the 40th Ward of the city. Joining me this morning are Kevin Connolly, Misericordia's Chief Financial Officer, Hugh Connolly, Misericordia's Director of Development, and Douglas Moser of HKM Architects, the Project Architects, 
who are all available to answer any questions committee members may have. This matter was considered and recommended for passage by the Chicago Plan Commission on December 17th, 2020. I ask that the record of those proceedings be incorporated into the record before the committee today. So Alderman Osterman moves to incorporate the records from the plan commission by the same roll call that was used to determine quorum. Any objections to that motion? Hearing none, the records from plan commission are incorporated. Continue. If one is from Chicago, one is undoubtedly aware of Misericordia Home and the work that it does with children and adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Misericordia currently serves 600 children and adults on its campus which is generally located at 6300 North Ridge Avenue in residential institutional plan development number 253 and has a waiting list of over 300 people at present. If we could change to the next slide, please. If we have the slides up. Okay, I, I had sent an abbreviated group of slides, but it looks like the entire, okay, that's, yeah, change to the next slide, please. Splendid, thank you. Ms. Recordia seeks to amend PD 253 by adding the property located at 1925 West Thome Avenue, which is immediately south of the existing campus as depicted on the site plan. The Thome Avenue parcel is approximately 2.86 acres in size and the current campus is just under 32 acres. The proposed amendment is mandatory to allow the inclusion of the Thome Avenue property within the boundaries of PD 253. Next slide, please. Adding this new parcel will allow for the construction of approximately 16 new intermediate care facility buildings of one and two stories, one or two stories, pardon me, there are both. Each building will accommodate between six and eight residents and approximately 48 staff members will live with and assist those residents. Next slide, please. The architecture of the buildings is similar to the other buildings located throughout Misericordia's campus. A driveway is planned through the site, which will give the newly improved parcel the feel of a quiet residential street as shown on the perspective. This is of critical importance to Misericordia given the nature of the population it serves and how it must provide those services and how it cares for its residents. If we could walk through the next three slides slowly, please. We have worked closely with Alderman Vasquez and the community on this project, and I believe that the Alderman has submitted a letter of support to the committee. I have nothing further, but we will be happy to answer any questions committee members may have. Okay, thanks, Joe. Um, we do have a letter of support from Alderman Vasquez. Mm -hmm. We do, okay. Uh, questions from or comments, committee members, who's up? Yep, o I Osterman. Knew. Okay, Harry, uh, do you wanna talk about this magnificent project? I wanna talk about this magnificent project and just uh, 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 thank um, the team that put this together, uh, specifically uh, the Conleys, Kevin Conley and, uh, and Sister Rosemary. I think anyone that knows Mr. Cordy knows that they do amazing work, um, the need um, is, is vast and um, they keep it going. And also as someone who's grown up in this neighborhood very near this, uh, Misericordia has grown throughout the years um, to really create a campus environment for uh, the people that they serve and their families. And I think this is a, is a wonderful addition. And I think that um, um, we all look forward to supporting. I think they also have a, a bakery that's gonna open up in the near future, right down the street. Um, so. Um, with gluten-free donuts, Tom, not to compete with cinnamon rolls, but uh, this is a great project and I'm very proud to support it today. Thank you. Thank you, Harry, and thank you for the comments also. Um, I don't see any other hands up, but uh, as I said, as I said in, in Plan Commission, uh, the work that they do is, uh, as I said in Plan Commission, nothing short of a miracle. So the opportunity to uh, expand their campus, uh, working with the residents that surround it is uh, a real credit to the community, to Ms. Recordia and to the Alderman. So I, I wanted to uh, compliment the team. And also uh, I was hoping Sister Rosemary was gonna be on the, the call. Uh, Chairman, she was on the last one, as you know, she couldn't be here this morning, but 
she wants to send along how grateful she is to everybody in Zoom. Well, so thank yeah. You. She's gonna, yep. She's gonna go to heaven, and she's gonna get us all in behind her. Okay. Oh, uh, and as Alderman Osterman said, there's no, uh, no competing with Ann Sathers. Yeah. Well, <laughs> gluten free is a. Comp <laughs> yeah. I'll let that. I'll let that slide. Okay. So. All righty. Well, everybody. Uh, so let me get a motion uh, to move to pass on this item. So moved, Alderman Lopez, Chairman. Alderman uh, Ray Lopez moves uh, do pass by the. Uh, same roll call that was used to determine quorum. Um, any objections to that motion? Hearing none, the item is passed as revised. Correct? Yeah. Staff? Yeah. Okay. Thank all you, right. Chairman, and thanks to all for their kind comments. And, and your backdrop is one of the more interesting backdrops. Whoa. So this morning, this morning, I don't see a Cub or Sox emblem in there, but I feel like I'm in Europe somewhere. That's in the other room. Yeah. All right, buddy. All right. Thanks. Be well. Thanks. Thank you. All right, uh, here we are now on our last couple items here uh, before we get into the mayorals. And we'll start on page uh, 12, document number 20345, 46th Ward. Ordinance was referred on February 19th of 2020. Common address 1038 through 1054 West Wilson Avenue, 4600 through 4608 North Kenmore, and 4600 through 4612 North Winthrop. Uh, change request. Residential business plan development number 1329 to residential business plan develop, development number 1329 as amended. Katie Janke Dale. Thank you for your patience, Katie. Can you proceed on this one? Thanks. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Katie Janke Dale with the law firm of DLA Piper, located at 444 West Lake, which represents the applicant 1050 Wilson Partners LLC. As a preliminary matter, this application was uh, considered and recommended for approval at the December 17th, 2020 Plan Commission hearing. We'd request that a transcript of that hearing be incorporated into the record here today. Alderman uh, Raymond Lopez moves to incorporate the records from the Plan Commission by the same roll call that was used to determine quorum. Any objections to his motion? Hearing none, the records are incorporated and continue, Katie. Thank you. This is a two sub area PD, um, PD number 1329, that's located at the northwest corner of Wilson and Kenmore. Sub area A consists of a two building or er, two story historic building that's uh, proposed for a future venue use, which is shown on this next slide. You want to advance it one more? Um, sub area A is shown on the left. Sub area B is proposed for a new residential building, uh, which is shown on the next slide which will consist of 62 units in a five-story building with 13 parking spaces. We worked with Alderman Kappelman on this, and I think I saw him on the screen, um, but we also should have a letter of support on file from him. And with that, we're available for any questions that you may have. All right. Um, Katie, uh, I'm sorry, uh, just for my own edification, the, the ex there's an existing theater there? No, the, um, it's so part of the amendment that we're doing is to allow for a venue, um, venue as a permitted use in the existing building on the left hand side of the screen. Okay. Not identified yet, though. Correct. Okay. All righty. Uh, uh, let's see. What do we have? We have Alderman Kappelman. Is he on the call? James? Yes. Thank been you. Been quiet, James. We haven't heard <laughs> from you yet. So. That's true. All right, but this is exciting, so let's talk about it. Okay. Uh, so this is really just an amendment to the uh, plan development, opening up the, the building on the left, 1050 West Wilson, to a mu music venue that's not yet been identified, but we all know who it is. <clears throat> and then uh, for the uh, other side, it's on the 4600 block of North Kenmore, uh, about a uh, half block from my home. Uh, it is a reduction from eight stories to five stories. Uh, other than that, there's really not much of a change. So I ask uh, uh, my colleagues to approve this. All right, questions for the applicant or the alderman? Hearing none, I get a motion to pass by the same roll call that was used to determine quorum. Move to pass. Alderman Wagas back. Alderman Wagas do pass on the item. Any, Any objections, objections to the motion? motion? Hearing none, the um, item is passed as revised. Um, 
Congratulations. Thank you. All right, now we're moving on our last item on the regular agenda, I believe. Document number 20440, 48th Ward. Ordinance was referred on July 22nd of 2020. Common address 50, 51 North Broadway. Change request. Residential business plan development number 1347 to residential plan development number 1347 as amended. Katie, you wanna talk about this one? Thank you again for the record. My name is Katie Jenke Dale with the law firm of DLA Piper at 444 West Lake, which represents the applicant at 5050 North Broadway property LLC. This uh, matter was also considered and recommended for approval at the December 17th, 2020 plan commission hearing. We would request that a transcript of uh, that record or hearing record um, be incorporated today. Ray Lopez moves to incorporate the records from the plan commission by the same roll call that was used to determine quorum. Any objections to that? Hearing none, the records are incorporated and we can continue. Thank you. Um, this also is a two sub area PD that's shown on the screen, PD 1347. It's generally located at 5050 North Broadway on the west side of the street and 5051 on the east side. Next slide. Sub area A, which is shown here, was completed in 2019 and consists of 342 units. Next slide. Sub area B is on the other side of Broadway and will consist of 180 units in a five story building. And that is the subject of this amendment, uh, which is required to allow residential on the ground floor along Winona, as shown here on the right hand side of the screen, uh, which would replace previously proposed commercial in that location. The, the portion of Subway B that is fronting Broadway on the left hand side will still have commercial uses on the ground floor. The east side of the street is uh, located in Alderman Osterman's ward and you should have a letter of support on file from him. The other portion of the plan development on the west side um, is in the 47th ward and while this amendment will have no impact on that sub area we also um, received a letter of no opposition from Alderman Martin which should also be in the file. With that I'm available for any questions but would uh, respect er, respectfully request your positive recommendation of this application. Thank you. All right thank you Katie. Alderman Osterman. This is a second phase of a, uh, a very dynamic uh, development that occurred um, with the renovation of the Aon insurance building um, that's been completed. Um, this will be the second phase of it. Uh, I support it. Um, the developer involved was able to increase the affordability at the, all the, myself and Alderman Poir's request when this was first passed. So i uh, like to support the amendment and look forward to uh, the development of this site. Great, thank you Alderman. Any questions for the applicant or the alderman? Hearing none, can I get a motion to move to pass by the same roll call that was used to determine quorum? Cardona moves. Alderman Cardona moves uh, do pass. Any objections to his motion? Hearing none, um, the item is passed as revised. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Now, that concludes the map. All right, that con concludes the map amendments. So what are we doing? Go out of order to all okay. Things. Okay, we're going to go out of order to stick with um, Alderman Osterman, right? Is that what we're doing? Correct. Okay, so that's is the document number 02020 5914 in the 48th Ward, the historical landmark designation for the Perkins Nordeen House located at 6106 North Kenmore. We've got Matt, Matt Crawford here from uh, Department of Planning and he's going to make the presentation. Matt? Thank you, Chairman. Uh, members of the committee, can you hear me? Loud and clear. Mm -hmm. Very good. So again, Matt Crawford, coordinating planner with the Department of Planning and Development. I'm here to recommend on behalf of the Commission on Chicago Landmarks that the Perkins Nordeen House be designated as a Chicago landmark. Next slide. The house is located at 6106 North Kenmore in the Edgewater community in the 48th Ward and Alderman Osterman has supported the designation. Next slide. The house is a rare survivor of the large homes that define the early history of Edgewater. It is also an excellent example of the arts and crafts and international design movement that originated in England. Next slide. In addition, the house was designed by Pond and Pond 
brothers and accomplished architects from Chicago at the turn of the 20th century, who also were great supporters of progressive movements in Chicago. Next slide. Finally, the house is important for its association with the late Ken Wardeen, a nationally significant jazz and spoken word artist who resided and worked out of this house from 1951 until his passing in 2019. Next slide. The current owners of the property, Richard Logan and Angela Spinazzi, have consented to the landmark designation and they're restoring the building. So on behalf of the Commission on Chicago Landmarks, I recommend passage of the ordinance designating the house as a Chicago landmark, and I'm here to answer any questions you have. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Um, handsome uh, house. Uh, Alderman Osterman. Um, just would ask the committee's support in this. Uh, this is a uh, historic building in our community. Uh, the community is in support of the historic designation and the new owners are going to um, uh, fix it up in the way that will keep it for many, many years to come. But uh, I support this today and would ask the committee's support. Questions? I see uh, Alderman Hopkins. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, no questions. Just wanted to uh, state for the record that uh, I'm very pleased to see this. Uh, Ken Nordeen was an amazing artist. Uh, he was also a personal friend of mine. Uh, he and his late wife, Burl, just two of the most kind-hearted, wonderful people you would ever meet, and also two of the biggest Blackhawks fans I've ever known in my life. Uh, and I'm just uh, happy thinking back that uh, they got to see their beloved Blackhawks um, win the Stanley Cup. Uh, not once, not twice, but three times uh, during their, their twilight years. They were uh, great Chicagoans, uh, and, and both were actually quite, uh, quite remarkable artists, uh, so that their legacy will live on in so many ways, uh, including the uh, landmark designation uh, for the home that uh, Ken did so much of his recording in his home studio uh, and is uh, so closely associated with the, uh, the body uh, of his amazing career. I'm pleased to support this. And it's a wonderful gesture for the Nordine family. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman. I don't see any other hands. Um, so um, no further questions. Do I get a motion to move to pass by the same roll call that was used to determine quorum? So move, Mr. Chairman. Um, that is Alderman Hopkins moves to pass. Um, any objections? Hearing none, the item is passed. Congratulations. All right, we're going to stay on the landmark items, and I'm going to move to Back to page eight. Well, all right. The addendum. <laughs> addendum. So we're gonna we're gonna move to document number zero two zero two zero dash five nine zero six in the twentieth ward. That being the historical landmark designation for the Emmett Till and Mamie Till Mobley House at sixty four twenty seven South St Lawrence Avenue. Again, uh, we have Matt Crawford here from the Department of Planning and Development to make the presentation. Uh, Matt. Thank you, Chairman and members of the committee. I'm here to recommend on behalf of the Landmarks Commission that the Emmett and Maybe Till Mobley House be designated as a Chicago landmark. This building is a modest two flat, but it's of monumental historic and memorial significance. It's a brick two flat at 6427 South St. Lawrence Avenue, and it was the home of Emmett Till and his mother, Maybe Till Mobley. It was from this house that Emmett Till left with his uncle to, vis to visit relatives in Mississippi in 1955. The 14-year-old Till was lynched during the trip. The tragic murder of Till became a symbol of the brutality of racism in America, and it galvanized the civil rights movement in this country. Next slide. The home is located in the Woodlawn community area in the 20th Ward and Alderwoman Jeanette B. Taylor supports the landmark designation. Next slide, please. Emmett Till was born in 1941 at Cook County Hospital. Emmett and his mom, Mamie, would live in Summit, Illinois, and then Detroit before finally settling into the two flat in Woodlawn in November, 1951. Next slide. Emmett turned 14 in 1955. That summer, his uncle from Mississippi invited him and other cousins from Chicago down south for a visit to extended family. Emmett and his cousins and his uncle took the city of New Orleans train to the small town of Webb, Mississippi. Next slide. 
On August 24th, Emmett and his cousins visited this store in Money, Mississippi, owned by Roy Bryant. Bryant, who was white, was out of town on business, and the store was being run by his wife, Carolyn. Accounts of what happened during Emmett's visit to the store differ, but it got around to Bryant that Emmett Till had a verbal interaction with his wife, an act that in the Jim Crow South could mean lynching for a black man. Next slide. Three days later, Bryant's husband, Roy, and his brother, J.W. Milam, kidnapped, tortured, and shot Till and dumped his body in the Tallahatchie River. Mamie Till had her son's body returned to Chicago for funeral and burial. She took the extraordinary and bold step to display her son's mutilated body in an open casket. Pictures of Emmett's battered body were published in Chicago's Jet magazine. The photographs were a catalyst for African-Americans wanting political and social change. After the funeral, Emmett's mother traveled to Mississippi to attend the trial of Bryant and Milam, who had been charged with her son's murder. After one hour of deliberation, the jury acquitted the men who would later confess to the murder. Next slide, please. Emmett's killing and the acquittal of her, his murderers motivated African-Americans to demand justice. Three months after the trial, Rosa Parks cited Till's murder for her refusal to give up her seat to a white passenger on a, on a Montgomery City bus. Soon after, a young and relatively unknown minister named Martin Luther King Jr. called for a citywide bus boycott and the civil rights movement in America was born. For more than four decades, Mrs. Mobley spoke about racial injustice, worked to bring her son's killers to justice and help children living in poverty. She worked as a teacher in Chicago public schools for 23 years. She died in 2003 at age 81. Next slide, please. The property uh, is now owned by Blacks and Green, a neighborhood nonprofit organization led by Naomi Davis. Ms. Davis has consented to landmark designation and plans to convert the house to a place associated with Emmett and his mom's memory. So on behalf of the commission, I respectfully recommend passage of the ordinance designating the Till House as a Chicago landmark. And again, I'm here to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Matt. Do we have, Do we have questions? This is one or comments. comments. Uh, uh, August. August. Thanks, Chairman. Uh, I just wanna say thank you to Matt for putting this uh, piece together here uh, on Emmett Till's home. Um, and with the ownership, you mentioned uh, it's a not-for-profit, or did I mistake that? That's, That's correct, correct Alderman. Alderman. So, it's a non-profit organization, organization called, called Black Green. They're, They're doing, doing a lot in the Westwood West community. community. And is the city, are, are they looking at some of the rehab of the outside of the property, or um, have they applied for anything, any historic tax credits or anything like that um, based on the home itself? They're still evaluating the property has a number of uh, condition issues that need to be addressed and Blacks and Green is aware of those issues. Um, so we have not seen a permit yet, but the department is committed to working with Blacks and Green on this project, as well as to secure vacant lots immediately next to it um, so that this, this memorial site is respected and, and however, Blacks and Green want to move it forward. Okay, thank you for that. I, I think um, it would be interesting if you could give us an update at some point, either on the committee or via the uh, chairman, just to see the progress of that and um, what landmarks might be doing in terms of historical marker. Um, but uh, thank you, chairman, that's all I had. I just wanted to see if we can get an update on that in the future, thank you. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Thank you. Chairman, can I add one other point that I neglected to mention in my presentation? Yes, Matt. That this report was brought to us by Preservation Chicago. They did a lot of the research and writing for this report. 
in concert with a professor at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, in concert with Naomi uh, Davis at Blacks and Green. So they deserve a ton of credit for bringing this to the commission. Thank you. Um, Alderman Kappelman. Yes, thank you so much. Um, a quick question. Uh, because this also has national significance and it really uh, brought forth um, a lot of work to address uh, racism that still has to continue on. Is there been any thought about making this also uh, under the National Historic Registry? I think that would be totally appropriate, Alderman. Um, this would certainly qualify a, as a National Register property and perhaps even qualify as what's called an NHL or a National Historic Landmark, which is a step above simple National Register. Thank you. That's more work for us to do, but it's worth it. I think so. Thank you, Alderman. And um, I know we um, have a uh, strong uh, support from Alderman Taylor, Alderwoman Taylor, she couldn't stay on uh, this late in the call, but uh, obviously she is in firm support of this as we all are. And it looks like it could be the first of many steps to recognize um, the, both the positive and the negative in regards to Emmett Till, but uh, so be it. All right, um, if there are no more questions or comments from committee members, do I get a, a motion moved to pass by the same roll call that was used to establish quorum. I move Chairman Alderman Lopez. Alderman Ray Lopez moves to pass. Um, any objections to the motion? Hearing none, uh, the item is passed. All right, next uh, landmark uh, designation is document number 02020-6031 in the 42nd Ward, the historical landmark designation for the Illinois Bell Building located at 225 West Randolph Street. And again, uh, we have Matt Crawford uh, to make the presentation. Matt. Thank you, Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, here to recommend on behalf of the Landmarks Commission that the Illinois Bell Building, a 31-story skyscraper built in the loop in 1966, be designated as a Chicago landmark. Next slide. The building is located at Randolph and Franklin in the Loop in the 42nd Ward. Next slide. Historically, the building reflects Chicago's successful drive to retain corporate headquarters, usually in modern high rises in the 1960s, while other cities were losing these businesses to suburban office campuses. Next slide. Architecturally, the building is, is a significant example of new formalism a rare architectural style that emerged late in the modern movement. Finally, the building is, is significant for its architects, Holabird and Brute, who designed many Chicago landmarks that you can see here. Next slide. The designation is being pursued along with a Class L application by the building's contract purchaser that plans to renovate the building to accommodate modern commercial uses, offices. BPD is written, has the written consent of both the contract purchaser and the current owner of the building for the landmark designation. So on behalf of the commission on Chicago landmarks, I respectfully recommend passage of the ordinance designating the Illinois Bill, Bell Building as a Chicago landmark. And of course, I'm here to answer any questions. Thank you. All right. Questions, comments, committee members? Uh, I just, first of all, I, I think it's a, it's a handsome building. Matt, was this 1966? Did I see that? That's right, Chairman. 1966, wow. um, example of modern architecture, and it's unusual in the sense that it's clad with um, not just black glass that we see all the time, but this granite uh, marble finish. Yeah. This is Pretty unusual stuff for the 60s, um, but it was a style called new formalism, and we don't have many examples of this in Chicago. That, yeah, that's what I was I was saying. For the 60s, it's pretty dramatic, and uh, I don't see a lot of that in and around town. So uh, the only uh, the other one that what was the Inland Steel Building though? What year was that? 
That is also a Chicago landmark. It's a bit earlier, but that's more mid-century modern. Other examples of new formalism in Chicago would be the American Dental Association building in Streeterville. Um, it's again, it's pretty rare. You see a lot of this in California, but not too much in Chicago. Beautiful building. Uh, questions, comments? Ray Lopez, Alderman Lopez. Thank you, <clears throat> excuse me, thank you, Chairman. I just had one quick question for Matt. Um, and kind of for these three items and then kind of like for the next four, what's the cost of the weight of the uh, landmark fee for these, item, for these three items? Um, Alderman, we, we don't charge a, a fee to landmark buildings. Um, sometimes we prepare the reports as staff members. Uh, sometimes uh, when a developer is seeking landmark designation, for example, in the case of Illinois Bell, we will tell that developer, because you're seeking designation as, as part of an incentive, we ask them to hire a consultant to prepare the report for us and for you so that staff time is not being devoted to something where an incentive is involved. So then in the, like the cases of the ones that are following the five next where you ask for fee waivers, um, what are the values of those? Correct, and um, my colleague Michelle Rhymes can answer that. But those fee waivers are related to the fact if, if you're applying for a building permit to change or alter your landmark property in Chicago, um, because landmarking does impose uh, additional responsibilities on homeowners, city council has uh, adopted the fee waiver ordinance to uh, reduce the yeah, that burden slightly. So it waives the building permit fee that applicants would pay to the Department of Buildings. Okay, thank you. Further questions, comments? All right. Uh, Alderman Hopkins moves approval okay. and deposits 20 cents for the next three minutes. All mm -hmm. right, uh, so Alderman Hopkins uh, moves to pass by the same roll call that was used to determine quorum. Any objections? Hearing none, the item is passed. Um, now we are going to go into the mayoral amendments. All right. Uh, what page is it for the? Top of the addendum. Top of the addendum. We're moving on to document number uh, 02020-6207. Mayoral amendment modifying municipal code chapter 17-7 by adding new section 17-7-0580, establishing a multi-unit preservation Pilsen district. And we have Patrick Murphy and Commissioner Navarro, hopefully still on the call to testify. So um, who would like to start? I would assume Patrick Murphy. Uh, I can, Chairman. Um, I can run through a brief overview of the ordinance, and then I can share a presentation, uh, run through a few sample blocks, uh, just to show how the ordinance uh, would play out, and then I could turn it over to Commissioner Navarro. Okay. All right. I'm sorry. We have Daniel Gertz. We don't have... Okay. So it's Daniel Gertz, I think, from housing that's going to be picking up that portion of it. So start. let's start on the zoning portion, please. Okay, yes, sir. All right, uh, on my screen is a brief summary of the ordinance. So I'll just start from the top here about the 606. Or I'm sorry, about uh, Pilsen. Good afternoon, Chairman, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Patrick Murphy with the Department of Planning and Development. I'm joined here, as you said, by Daniel Hertz from the city's Department of Housing. And we are here to discuss proposed anti-displacement changes that will impact certain sections of the municipal code in the zoning chapter as they regulate the types of residential structures which can be established based on the context of a particular block and its associated zoning districts. Uh, specifically to the Pilsen district, and I'll run through these slides here next after I get done, is that uh, our proposal is to restrict the prevalence of single family homes and two flats in RT4 zoning districts, along with our all RM districts, all B and all C districts within a specific boundary within Pilsen that I will run through next. 
outlined in blue is the area of Pilsen that we are we are we are proposing for this ordinance. The current zoning districts are identified in the three colors in the middle on the bottom of the chart. As you can see, an overwhelming amount of the residentially zoned properties are already zoned RT4 up through RM 6.5. So those are the middle range, the starting to get three flat and larger buildings in the city up to our most dense neighborhood residential zoning districts. The green and the purple that you will see that run along various commercial corridors indicate the commercial and business zoning in which this would also apply. Excuse me. The next few slides will run through a few examples of blocks where we have gone out and analyzed the structures that are there and the occupancy of those buildings from a dwelling unit standpoint, not individual people, and how this ordinance could impact those going forward. So here we have 13 residential structures, like the chart says on the right hand side of the screen, six are single family and two flat six are three units or more and one is non non-residential this would allow for only the construction of three unit plus buildings within this block so if a building were to be purchased for renovation or if a vacant lot were to be rebuilt because of the context of the block a density requirement would be of three units or more under the zoning uh, for this particular block Again, we went to the 1600 block of, of Allport, did the same analysis of the existing structures and their usage today. The analysis is on the side, but the, the result is that because of the prevalence of single family homes in two flats, it would be allowed for a single family home or two flat structure to still be provided because the context of the block, as we were saying before, allows for that lower density. The, there is not a predominance of larger, more than three flat structures along the block. 1800 block of West Cullerton, same analysis was done. Of the 22 structures, 14, so more than 50%, were a single family home and two flats, and that would allow for a single family home or two flat structure to be provided. And finally, we did the 2200 block of West 21st place, 22 total structures, and again, because of the lower density that exists in some of these areas, even with the RT4 zoning, it would still allow for the lower density. What we are looking to affirm through this ordinance is an ability though to preserve the units that we do have and ensure that there are multi-unit buildings that can be provided going forward. I'll turn it over to Daniel if he has anything to add from the Department of Housing in relation to this ordinance. Sure, thank you, Patrick, uh, and uh, good afternoon, uh, members of the committee. Uh, for the record, my name is Daniel Hertz. I am the Director of Policy of the Department of Housing. I have just a few uh, slides and a presentation, so I will bring that up now. Um, so uh, Patrick went through the, the, the zoning uh, mechanisms of this ordinance. I wanted to say just a few words from the Department of Housing's perspective about you know, what we hope this ordinance will do um, and what problem we, we hope it addresses. So this really comes out of the department's um, longstanding concern, what we know is shared by many, many members of the committee, including the aldermen and the affected areas. Um, and community members and others around uh, the loss of two to four flat buildings, small uh, scale multifamily buildings in Chicago. Um, we know that these buildings make up more than a third of Chicago's housing stock and um, just as importantly, are a major source of uh, what's called naturally occurring affordable housing. That is to say, housing that has uh, low or moderate rents um, but that are not legally restricted and are not are not subsidized and so are vulnerable to being lost and, and as a neighborhood uh, gentrifies as as um, as property values increase. Um, what we've seen is in particular in places where um, values are rapidly growing that these buildings can often be torn down um, or deconverted through gut rehab into single family homes. 
Um, in fact, Chicago lost some 20,000 units in two to four unit buildings um, between 2010 and 2016. And this has been identified as an important issue um, in the city's five-year housing plan, uh, reports from uh, groups like the Institute for Housing Studies, the Council Latino Caucus, and many other community stakeholders. Um, in particular, in the 606 area in Pilsen that are affected by the ordinances in front of the committee today, um, we've been able to work with the Institute for Housing Studies uh, that has provided um, preliminary data of their analysis of how many of these deconversions and loss of these units they've seen uh, just in these areas. So between 2013 and 2018, which is the most recent data that they have available at the moment, uh, their preliminary uh, data shows 25 deconversions in Pilsen and 59 deconversions uh, in the 606 west of Western. Um, and, you know, it's important that these numbers um, represent many more housing units, many more homes uh, than just the number of buildings. If there's an average of three units per building, that's, we're talking potentially about 75 rental units lost in Pilsen. Um, and 177 lost uh, in the 606 area where this is uh, even more advanced. And I think it's important that, you know, we see these ordinances as trying to stem a growing uh, trend of, of this sort of, um, uh, this sort of loss of two to four flat buildings. Um, we want to get this in place um, before this becomes even more uh, widely held in these areas. Um, so this ordinance, um, basically is adapting, as Patrick said, the zoning uh, within these, uh, within the neighborhood context and policy priorities of the city. Um, historically, the emphasis with zoning has been preventing overly dense development. So mostly zoning has set a ceiling on density uh, in Chicago and elsewhere. Um, but as I've said, you know, we've increasingly realized over the last decade or two that actually the loss of density in some neighborhoods is just as big of a uh, problem and can create problems not just for affordable housing, but also things like school enrollment and reduced foot traffic to um, neighborhood retail districts. So essentially what this ordinance does is it recognizes that reality and it makes uh, in these particular areas, uh, zoning restrictions symmetrical um, by uh, creating both a uh, ceiling, uh, retaining the same ceiling that already existed, um, but also in some instances creating a floor and saying that um, you know zoning will also uh, create a check on the ability to reduce density, reduce, uh, take away these units, and, and particularly two to four unit buildings. Um, the last thing that I just want to say is that the department um, is uh, very proud uh, to be moving this forward in, in partnership with DPD and, and with the aldermen and community groups that we've been working with. Um, but we do want to acknowledge that this is uh, one way we see to slow displacement of low and moderate income families. Um, it's not a sil silver bullet, it doesn't uh, solve the problem entirely. Um, I do want to flag that we're working with um, aldermen, stakeholders, and other city departments uh, and intend to uh, introduce a, a demolition fee uh, as well in these areas. Um, and I also want to just highlight some of the other approaches really quickly that we're taking to address displacement in these areas and in other parts of the city. Um, so this includes you know, things like the Chicago Community Land Trust which was allocated uh, $3 million from the Affordable Housing Opportunity Fund to um, acquire owner-occupied uh, housing and, and, and establish that as long-term or quasi-permanent affordable housing. The Chicago Low Income Housing Trust Fund, which has expanded uh, its portfolio um, by up to 500 units and is um, currently working to place those units uh, around the city in particular in areas where displacement is a concern. Obviously, the Affordable Requirements Ordinance, which uh, requires affordability in many new construction multifamily uh, market rate buildings, and the department is continuing to work um, on introducing a, a set of revisions to strengthen the ARO and get even um, more uh, out of that ordinance. And then, of course, the department's affordable multifamily development and preservation activities, um, building purpose-built um, uh, predominantly or even 100% affordable housing uh, in these areas and other parts of the city. Um, and with that, I'm happy to take any questions from the committee. No. 
Okay. Um, I want to be before we open the questions. I believe this is entirely in the twenty fifth ward. So I'm going to ask if he's Correct. on the call. If, he, if, I, if he's on the call, Alderman Cicho Lopez, would you like to comment on this, Byron? Yes, uh, Chairman, and uh, thank you, um, thank you to the Housing Department and DPD to working in collaboration with uh, with our office uh, and the stakeholders. Uh, this is, uh, as uh, uh, Daniel said, uh, not a silver bullet, but a step in the right direction. The the huge issue of displacement that we have across the city. Um, it is, um, I think that this is a, a step forward to changing the direction in which we were going uh, from uh, a, land, a huge landmark designation that would have made our community more expensive to an alternative that will give us the ability to discuss projects as they come in. So again, this, um, this conversion um, ordinance is not the silver bullet, but allows community members to have a discussion around zoning. They uh, have a conversation about projects that come in the community. And as the Department of Housing has identified, we have seen developers coming in um, and have little oversight in what comes in, in the community, losing uh, naturally occurring affordable housing uh, by the thousands. I want to remind my colleagues in the in zoning committee that we have lost because of the lack of action uh, over 10,000 residents over the last um, 14,000 actually over the last um, a decade plus. So it is urgent that we start developing uh, policies in coordination with the housing department, planning, and our stakeholders so that we can uh, allow our community to have public meetings, community meetings, as we revise uh, uh, the new projects. We strongly believe that we can have development without displacement, but that will necessarily uh, depend on the conversations that we're having. Not doing anything, not taking action, not having a conversation uh, is not an option. We, we continue to see uh, people leaving the city, but they're leaving because of lack of affordable housing and social services and things that we need to continue to discuss as a council with our communities locally. I think that the conversion ordinance is a, is a, is the, um, is a welcoming um, policy that can help us again uh, address the issues that we have. This is not an imposition on pop and property rights, as unfortunately some people have, have said, quite the contrary. It is a discussion that must have. What we don't, we, we cannot afford is continue to have uh, um, developers could come in without any checks and balances and have continued to erode the social fabric of our community. So again, this is a collaboration with uh, all the stakeholders, a collaboration with the housing department with policies that work or zoning uh, and just relevant to zoning or zoning in Pilsen has a lot of mismatching. So policies like these are really hard to uh, develop. So I wanna uh, uh, commend the housing department Commissioner Navarra and, 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 her, and her team for coming to our community, listen to what we discussed after the landmark discussion uh, to give us the possibility to have conversations in our community. I think that this opens the opportunity for us to have more dialogue, more collaboration and develop policies that can help us. I know that there are other policies that I heard this morning talking about the ADU, um, demolition fees impacts, the ARO reform. There are others that I think that we continue to, that we must continue discussing, but I think that this is an opportunity for us to start the conversation, to stop the displacement, the massive displacement that goes with developers who pay little attention to the community that they, that they come in. And I, I think that this will be a great step. I hope that colleagues support us in these efforts. And thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Alderman. Um, and we do have a couple of questions from committee members. And we'll start with Alderman Kappelman. Thank you so much. Um, I, I, in many ways, I'm delighted by this because uh, affordable housing, we're, we're at a crisis like we've never seen before. And I remarked about this before almost 50 years ago when I had my first apartment and I had a part-time job paying my way through school. Even with a part-time job, my uh, income was uh, one-tenth, I know one-tenth of my uh, entire rent um, I, I could do. It was only $50 a month. So, so that's extraordinarily important. Um, I, I also think too that, you know, when we took our oath of office, we, 
we swore to uphold the U.S. Constitution, and there has some been there's been some discussion that this could be um, unconstitutional. So, could I hear from the city's law department on the constitutionality of this proposed ordinance? All right, uh, James. Uh, we heard that in the public comment period, also. So, who do we have on from law uh, that can answer this question? Uh, Lisa Mishers on. Lisa. Uh, Yes. Hi, Alderman. And unfortunately, my video is not working. Um, but I can answer that question. Be happy to. Um, Alderman Kappelman, are you speaking specifically about the deconversion part of this ordinance? Any part of the ordinance. Okay. Well, yes, we have we have reviewed at the law department and we feel very confident that it would pass any uh, constitutional challenge. The um, minimum density portion of this is a legitimate land use regulation that would not be subject to strict scrutiny. Um, it's intended to promote the general welfare and address a problem that many in the community consider a very serious um, public uh, health and welfare issue. So the minimum density uh, aspect of this um, is, um, is no problem at all. The um, Extension of the moratorium, we also feel is uh, will pass would pass constitutional muster without any issues, um, mainly because the moratorium that's been in place has not been in place for um, for very long. Um, this is a very short extension, and this has been a difficult year to um, uh, I said to work essentially because of the pandemic. So I think there would be some uh, some leeway in that direction as well. Um, the purpose of the short extension is to uh, 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 meet with the community and other stakeholders about the proposed uh, demolition uh, fee. And uh, uh, Lisa, very, Lisa, yes. we're talking, we're, we're not talking about the 606 right now. I know that okay. the land land issues are can be the same, uh, okay. but we're specifically talking about Pilsen and the uh, uh, similarity of the blocks have, you know, the two. Yes, two yes, that's not a problem. I'm sorry, uh, we've sort of been thinking about the Pilsen and the 606 in concert. We'll, get, we'll get to that in a few minutes. Yeah, but no, no problem. I don't. There's. This is a very um, straightforward and legitimate land use regulation. All right. One of my, one of my um, confusions about all this is I've talked to a a, a uh, owner of a three flat, and um, he told me, which was hard for me to believe, that his his three flat is worth quite a bit more if it was converted to a single family home, which makes me think we're engaged in a taking and I, I don't want to enter that realm. Yes, it's not, it would not be a taking. Um, the government regulates uh, land use in many ways that affect value um, from, a sim from simple setback requirements to height requirements, uh, even you know, certain building code requirements, many, many factors affect the value of property. In this case, there would be a three factor test that would be applied to whether this is constitutional and economic impact would be taken into consideration, but the law does not guarantee the highest um, return on property value. Uh, so that's never the standard and for, for, for simple land use regulation. And uh, in this case, there would be many, you know, economically viable and profitable uses of the property would remain, even right. if they're not the most profitable. Yeah. All right, thank you. James, can I move to Alderman Ray Lopez? Yes, thank you. Okay. Raymond. Thank you, Chairman, and good afternoon, members of the committee. Um, I actually um, am glad that uh, Alderman Kappelman brought it up because that was actually gonna be one of the first things that I brought up, which is the fact that uh, contrary to Lisa's statement, I do believe this is regulatory taking of property as defined uh, so often. Um, I don't think that to simply say that this is just a land use issue when we've heard right now that this is a policy priority for this administration, for this department to force people who own multiple units 
to provide affordable housing, even if it is against their interest in creating a single unit residency on that same property. That is taking, that is not just land use. And I'd like to know, perhaps from uh, uh, zoning or whomever, I mean, what remedies do individuals have, say in this area, in this district, should they still own a two flat or a three flat and follow that same uh, example that Alderman Kappelman just gave where they choose to deconvert? Are they going to be stopped? Are they going to be uh, penalized through higher fees and uh, application costs, things of that nature? How will they be able to move forward if they choose to disregard what this district says? All right, I got the question. We've heard from Lisa. Um, in regards to uh, the actual permit, that would be buildings and zoning. So Patrick, do you wanna say if someone had a three flat and they come in for a, a permit to uh, reduce the number if, if, if the preponderance of the block was multi-unit? So what, you know, yeah. I think what Alderman Lopez wants is the reality check as to when this hits uh, either zoning or a building permit, which obviously zoning is the first step. Yes, so I, I think the, the first thing to answer the alderman's question is nothing in this ordinance prevents someone from seeking a zoning map amendment that lowers their zoning out of an RT4 district. So Alderman, for your example, if someone has an existing three flat, someone wants to buy that property, they no longer want to have a three flat. In order, but the, but the predominance of the block says multi-unit that is controls based on this ordinance, they would need to seek a, a zoning map amendment to remove themselves from an RT4, say to an RT3 and a half or an RS3, and then proceed with what they want to do. So it, it, as opposed to a zoning map amendment to increase your density, it would be a zoning map amendment to allow your decreased density. And we're making an assumption that it's individuals who are moving in but what if it's just a family that wants to do that? It, it, it could be anyone. It could be someone who will, no, it doesn't have to be someone who's new to the community. It could be someone who owns the property today, someone who occupied the property today. And as of right now, if that were so, you know, this is obviously a Pilsen district, but if there's a, a Brighton Park two flat owner who wanted to make it into a single family unit, their process would be very much different than what Pilsen two flat owner would be going through, correct? Right, this would only hold for the boundary that I had shown earlier, correct? So we are now, so what concerns me is that if you have individuals who own a two flat, I live in a two flat, you are now forcing people who may have not signed up for this, adding an undue burden onto them for what is everyone else's right throughout the city of Chicago, forcing them to actually provide housing or options for housing, even though they may not even want to be the default affordable housing provider for the city of Chicago? Well, I would add that if they already have a two flat today, that two flat can remain and continue to function as a two flat. There is no requirement that they add a third or any additional unit. So it, it can continue to operate as it is today. Both, both occupancy and, oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, it's just Alderman, I was just going to quickly jump in, and this is Daniel uh, Hertz from the Department of Housing. I also just want to clarify, there's no requirement in this ordinance that uh, units in these buildings be rented for any certain amount. So there's no legal restrictions uh, on, on affordability, right? This is, I think, what the, the department is coming from is that we know that this is a type of housing that often does provide moderate cost housing in many Chicago neighborhoods, but this is not forcing uh, owners into an affordability agreement with the city at all. Well, what you're forcing people to do is if they have a two flat, is that if they choose to make it a single family home, they're not going to be able to do it, even though as a property owner, it would be their right to do it everywhere else in the city of Chicago. What you're forcing people to do is to now live with a two flat that they will not rent. Because the, this assumption that these are affordable units that are accessible, which you just said 10 minutes ago as part of your policy for creating affordable housing 
and now saying that there's no guarantee that people are going to use them for units anyway, then why, what, what need are we filling if there's no requirement to use them? I mean, at the end of the day, this opens the door for starting to dictate to other neighborhoods that people are not in control of the properties they own to go downwards, to, to make a single family home if they are so inclined to do so. And I think that sets a very dangerous precedent because even though we've discussed briefly at the beginning, the issues of constitutionality, I will say that in reading even from like the uh, I just pulled up uh, like the Cato Institute says, you don't have to provide full enumeration. We know that. But if you're still negatively impacting through regulation, you are doing a regulatory taking as defined by the Fifth Amendment. And I think you are overly confident in your assumption that you are going to pass constitutional muster. And I would hope this law gets challenged to its fullest. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Alderman. Um, I don't see other hands up. Uh, questions or comments. Um, so uh, I'm Mr. Gonna, Mr. Chairman, question. Uh, Alderman Hopkins. Thank you. Uh, can you provide uh, examples of other jurisdictions where a residential zoning change is required in a residential district uh, to change to a lower density use? All right. That sounds like for Patrick. So the unique thing that is in the zoning code today is that we don't have, as, as, you, as you advance to more dense residential districts, you do not lose the lower, uh, the ability to provide lower density. So for instance, in the RM6 districts, you could still provide a single family home. And what we've been working on with the aldermen and with Department of Housing is looking at specific neighborhoods that have a lot of challenges now in maintaining density and maintaining a quantity of units and trying to use the use the, the zoning code and the, some of the provisions that are taking advantage of losing some of those units to require the units to remain. And it's based on the context of those blocks. So we're looking at 50% plus more of what the predominance is of these blocks. And if they are multi-unit, then preserving the multi-unit ability going forward and making sure that that is uh, preeminent in its importance for this in this purpose in these neighborhoods in Pilsen on these particular blocks. So to answer your question shortly, Alderman Hopkins, as you move up, there is no prohibition on providing lesser density, but that's what this ordinance would institute for this geography. And Alderman, right. right. So looking around the country, what other municipality or, or city or town or village uh, has a provision like this where you now have both a ceiling and a floor and it's no longer assumed that in a residential district if you're at maximum density by right you can always go down it's just a given it's a ceiling right so yeah. where where around the country is another example of this actually right. in practice today so there are another, Daniel may have some other information, but there are a number of municipalities over the last couple of years that have taken steps towards the elimination of single family homes, the lessening of uh, minimum lot area allowed for units, all in an effort, collectively in an effort to increase density in urban areas. So this is not, uh, this is not a unique approach. Well, I should say this is not a unique idea for the, to the city of Chicago. This may be a unique approach in how we're dealing with it in a very small geography, but there is a, a large trend throughout the country right. in looking at especially older urban center, old, older urban cities that reduce the amount of requirements to allow low density. And I think, I think Minneapolis is one right off the bat in my mind. Well, yes, that's been the most uh, pointed to, I guess you would say in the last couple of years, correct. Daniel? Yeah, I, I, I was I going to jump in. And... Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Let me just add one other thing. In looking around at other cities, and we did this as part of the ADU ordinance, as well as this ordinance, which we've been working on for, for close to a year now, well before the pandemic, is one thing to note about the city of Chicago is that we have a different uh, uh, like geographical way. structure compared to a lot of other cities. We have, you know, a lot of other cities have far larger zoning lots and, oops, sorry, and, and less density to begin within their urban centers 
compared to what we have. So we're dealing with already smaller lots and we're dealing with denser neighborhoods that we start with, which is different than some of the other cities that have been of note for this lately. Yeah, and I'll just jump in, uh, Daniel Hertz again. Quickly from on this one, because we've still got the 606 and, and I know I've got a, a, a police and uh, safety meeting uh, shortly thereafter, so. Okay, just very briefly to, to answer your question, Alderman. Um, Seattle is one example of a city, a large municipality that has recently instituted a, a, essentially a, a floor uh, in their zoning code. They did it um, in some targeted geographies, I think particularly around transit stations where they were trying to boost uh, density within proximity to transit. So that would be one, one other concrete example. All right, I don't see any other, other hands up. Um, so I would like to get a motion to move to pass on the ordinance, please. Osterman moves to pass. A roll call, please, Chairman. Okay, so Chairman, or uh, Housing Chairman, Osterman moves uh, to pass and um, Alderman Ray Lopez has asked for a roll call. So we will start with the roll. Everybody ready? Got on mic? All right. Alderman... Okay, let's let let me just reiterate. Voting yes means you're in favor of this ordinance, and obviously voting no means you do not favor uh, this ordinance. So this is the density uh, preservation ordinance in the 25th ward. All right, Alderman Hopkins. No. Alderman Dowell. Didn't hear from her yet. Alderman Sawyer. Uh, Alderman Ray Lopez. No. Alderman David Moore. David Moore. Alderman Mike Rodriguez. Aye. Alderman Cicho Lopez. Aye. Chairman, did you give me this Alderman Rodriguez? Yeah, we have you as an I, uh, Mike. Also, we have uh, Cicho Lopez as an I. Um, Alderman Burnett. Uh, I support the Alderman. All right, that's an I. Alderman Raboyas. I support the Alderman. Alderman Cardona. Felix. Let me get back to him. Alderman Wagesbeck. Aye. Alderman Kerry Austin. Aye. Alderman Viegas. Aye. Alderman Riley. Alderman Kappelman. No. Alderman Osterman. Aye. Alderman Haddon. Aye. No, I... Oh, Alderman Beal. How could you forget me, Mr. Chairman? Oh, <laughs> you know, you know how much I care about you, Tony. Yeah, I support the Alderman. All right. When y'all together yesterday? <laughs> this is public safety. All right. Um, and then Chairman Tunney is an I. Okay. All right. Let's get the let's get the numbers. I've got eleven. All right. Eleven yeas and three nays. All right. And those nays would be Alderman Lopez, Alderman Hopkins, and Alderman Kaplan. Correct. Okay. All right. So the ordinance passes and will refer to the full City Council. Okay. Next item. We're going to stay on this topic. Um, is this it? Yeah. Okay. So next we have document number 02020-6206, a mayoral amendment modifying municipal code chapters 17.2 and 17.7, residential zoning district uses and standards, and establishing the predominance of the block that's in the 606 district, as well as a brief extension of the 606 demolition moratorium. My understanding, we have a substitute on the matter, 
and you should have received it electronically. Uh, I'm going to ask Alderman Raboyas moves to accept the substitute by the same roll call that was used to determine quorum. Any objections on that substitute? No move, Mr. Chairman. All right. Any any objections? Okay. Hearing none, we have the substitute in front of us. Uh, we have probably the same Patrick Murphy and Daniel Gertz uh, to discuss uh, this uh, two-phased two uh, ordinance. Patrick. Yes, Chairman, thank you again. So again, my name is Patrick Murphy and I'm joined here uh, with Daniel Hertz from the Department of Housing. And as you noted, there is a substitute ordinance for the 606 provisions that we're discussing now. And specifically this substitute further relaxes the control percentages which were in the original ordinance as it relates to multi-unit buildings in RT 3.5 zoning districts. And we're expanding the impacted boundary from California further east to western. I'll get through the specifics on these percentages as well as get maps up related to the boundaries here shortly. But much like we just discussed on Pilsen, in the area around the 606, albeit different zoning districts, which I will get into, in this case, it's an RS3 and the RT three and a half, this proposal will prevent the establishment of single family homes when a majority of the block is lawfully improved otherwise. I'll go through the slideshow here in a second to explain the impacts of this and also to show some visual representations of blocks again in this neighborhood. Okay, so for instance, we have blocks existing around the 606 of which I'll get to uh, uh, images to show real life conditions that have a variety of improvements. And in these instances, we're dealing with either the creation of a two flat or the creation of a single family home. One key difference in this community as opposed to Pilsen is the zoning around the 606 is less dense. It, allow, it requires less density or allows for less density than what you can find in the RT4 zoning districts around, the six, around, around Pilsen. So this ordinance had to be tailored specifically to the zoning that exists in this community. As far as what we're specifically talking about, it encompasses four wards. However, I will note that there are currently no residentially zoned properties in the 36th ward. And as you can see, of the residentially zoned properties, an overwhelming amount of them are currently zoned RS3. And that is our most relaxed, our, our least intense single family home district. It allows for a single family home to be provided on the smallest zoning lot and also allows for the creation in specific circumstances of two flats. And that specific rule, which I'll go back here to the front, is what we use as the basis for this ordinance. So if you look at the top of this slide, we currently have a rule today that if a block of a block face is improved with 60% or more of multi-unit buildings, then there is an allowed reduction in MLA that can allow for a two flat to be established in an RS3 district. Going forward, we look at various blocks around the 606 and have created an inverse of that rule, whereby if a block is improved with multi-unit structures in an RS3, that's 50% plus one, then a multi-unit building is what could be provided. It's the same logic that we use around the Pilsen district, but it's just tailored, like I was saying, to the different zoning that is, that is in this neighborhood. So in this example, 1700 block of North Tallman in the first ward, 23 properties exist on the block face, 13 of them are existing single family homes. And so this would be eligible for a single family home construction. Moving to the 3,500 block of West McLean, 26th ward, 14 properties. Here, the predominance is multi-unit. So a multi-unit building is what would be allowed to be provided within this boundary on this block. 1800 block of North Keeler, 22 properties, a majority being single family homes, and therefore a single family home is what would be eligible for construction or improvement here if it were a vacant lot. And like I said before, the uh, 36 ward does not currently have any residentially zoned property. However, it was previously included in the boundaries of which this is mirroring around the 606 from earlier moratorium discussions. 
I will turn this back over to Daniel, but I would want to add one other thing. Uh, I did reference the RT three and a half zoning district. As you can see on this map, there are currently very few parcels. There are a couple in the 26th ward uh, around Albany and Whipple, just north of North Avenue, uh, as well as some a little bit further east in the first ward. If the property is zoned RT three and a half, we are lowering that threshold from 50% to 40% to be the controlling percentage. And that's really a twofold reason. One is because the RT three and a half district is the first district that starts to allow a wider variety of multi-unit properties. You can get to three unit properties, plus you have lower MLA requirements. And because it has a, a structure to it from a zoning standpoint that allows for multi-units, we worked with the aldermen, uh, you know, the, specifically the three impacted aldermen to lower the percentage from 50% to 40% to encourage or provide a means that's easier to maintain density on these blocks. And I'll turn it over to Daniel and I can certainly answer questions about this ordinance after Daniel is finished. Hi Alderman, uh, this is Daniel Hertz, again, Director of Policy, Department of Housing. Um, I think my uh, comments on the previous uh, ordinance uh, hold fully for, for this one as well. Um, the only addition uh, I would say is, you know, this ordinance also includes the uh, eight week extension of uh, the moratorium during which, as uh, we said, the department intends to work with uh, affected aldermen and community stakeholders, uh, as well as other city departments on the introduction of a demolition fee uh, as a second component of addressing um, displacement in this area. Okay. All right, Daniel, um, we have, I know, um, some of the affected aldermen that are on the call. Um, and I just, before we get to them, uh, the substitute, Patrick, what was literally in the substitute was the moratorium extension? Uh, no, there, well, more, from a zoning standpoint, there was a change in the boundary. We okay. used to only go to California. In we the now boundary. Go to okay. And we adjusted the percentages as it relates to the okay. RT three and a half district. Okay. And then correct, there is the moratorium portions. Yes, you are okay. correct, sir. Okay, so there were three There were three parts. All right, so um, let me just see. We have none of, I think none of the members are committee members. So I will go out of committee and I'll start with uh, uh, oh, uh, Alderman uh, Ramirez Rosa. Thank you so much, Chairman Tunney. And thank you to the zoning committee members for your time today. Last term, leader with the, leaders with the Logan Square Neighborhood Association and residents facing rising rents and housing costs near the 606 Bloomingdale Trail began organizing to address displacement in their neighborhood. Their organizing was rooted in their personal experiences as they saw families pushed out, local businesses closed, and school enrollment declined. The experience of these residents was corroborated by research conducted by the DePaul Institute for Housing Studies that found that the loss of affordable two and four flats was a serious issue in the 606 area that necessitated a government response. In 2015, in response to this displacement near the 606, loss of affordability and the resegregation of our community, LSNA leaders and residents began to take action. They organized, they knocked doors, they talked to neighbors, they did research, collected data, and they wrote an ordinance. Their efforts and that ordinance submitted last term, their or, uh, apologies, their efforts and that ordinance submitted last term are what led to this minimum density ordinance today. Thanks to LSNA and community efforts, one year ago we came together and between the mayor's office and local aldermen, we compromised to institute a demolition moratorium near the 606 to protect those two and four flats. At that time, we said it was a temporary fix to work towards a long-term solution. This ordinance today is part of that long-term solution. I'm proud to sponsor this minimum density anti-deconversion ordinance alongside the mayor and Alderman La Spada because it will help preserve our two and three flats and the affordability and diversity of our neighborhoods. But it's important to note that the minimum density ordinance for a portion of Logan Square Nervosa near the 606 trail is just one component of our strategy to preserve neighborhood character and affordability. Minimum density must be coupled with a demolition impact fee in Chicago neighborhoods where multifamily residential housing predominates. A demolition impact fee is critical to help curb climate change and mitigate demolition's environmental impact while helping to preserve the existing affordable two and three and four flats. Minimum density alone could promote demolition of existing multifamily housing and exacerbate that displacement. 
That is why the 606 minimum density ordinance before your committee today, this substitute includes a two month extension of the area of demolition moratorium. This final extension will allow us to finalize the demolition effect fee. And I'm so pleased that we were able to get to this compromise. We are so very close to finalizing the demolition impact fee. Thank you to everyone in the Department of Planning and Development, Housing, Law and Intergovernmental Affairs who have helped us get this far with crafting the solution to address displacement near the 606 trail. And a big thank you to the leaders at Logan Square Neighborhood Association who first initiated the grassroots campaign to address displacement near the 606. I credit their consistent organizing as the reason why the community input my office has received on this matter has been overwhelmingly positive and in support of taking these reasonable actions to address displacement in our neighborhoods. 50 years from now, future Chicagoans will judge us on our housing policy and by their outcomes. Will the housing policies we institute today work to address displacement or will they reify segregation? We need to recognize that it will take a whole host of government policies and interventions working in tandem to ensure Chicago has the racially and economically integrated communities we all want to see. We are taking steps towards helping to ensure Chicago has integrated and diverse communities, but we must do more. This is just one first step, but it has my support, my community support, and I ask the committee to support this measure so that it can take effect in a portion of my board. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman. And uh, Alderman Laspada, uh, you want to add to that and not uh, uh, reiterate from from the beginning. I will. I will not reiterate, sir. I will make my best effort to be additive. Um, but yeah, I'm really pleased to stand as a co-sponsor and supporter of this ordinance, in part because I was there in 2017 when my predecessor, when community organizations like LSNA started the fight to curb demolitions and the loss of housing in this area. I was standing with youth leaders in 2018 on the one year anniversary of that fight. I was with them marching along the Bloomingdale Trail on the second anniversary of that struggle. And now we're here four years after the challenge began of trying to address the loss of housing along the 606 area. And I'm glad that we've been able to work with zoning, with housing, with DPD and with Thankfully, gratefully, the mayor's administration on the first of what I believe will be several tools to maintain the integrity and the diversity of this part of our community. I also want to address the concern that came up during public comment related to public process. Um, not only did we hold several public meetings related to this over the last year and a half, but from February 2020 to July 2020, we had four open legislative ward nights, both online and in person for people to learn about this process, the research we were doing, the policies we were advocating for. Numerous other residents were met with individually or as a group. Uh, Mr. Colgan, who commented at the beginning about the lack of meetings, actually requested a meeting from us that we granted for him and other residents who were concerned. And unfortunately, he was the only one to not show up at that meeting. Um, but I want you to know, committee members, that we have tried to make our process around crafting this legislation as inclusive as possible um, to really preserve a diversity of housing stock, to really preserve a diversity of housing options in our community, to not say what you must do with your property, how you should rent it, but to recognize that the zoning decisions that we make have 25, 50, 75 year um, impacts. And that in preserving two to three housing in a rational, reasonable way, we are preserving the diversity of this community, both in its housing stock and its residents for decades to come. And thank, so you. Thank, thank you. Thank Alderman. you, Alderman. I support. I thank appreciate you. it. Um, and the rest of our committee members appreciate it too. Uh, I, we, our public safety meeting will, will commence immediately after this. So we've got, um, I don't see hands up for this particular one, but I'm going to need a motion to move through pass. On, motion to pass. As amended. And that motion move through pass as amended again is by Alderman Osterman and, um, 
All those in favor of the motion? Aye. 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 Any opposed to the motion? Okay, the ayes have it. Um, and it will be report, reported out to the uh, council tomorrow. Was that Chairman? someone's hand up or what? This is Lucia. I'm just clarifying that that motion was by the same roll call as was by, used. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Motion by the same roll call that was used to establish quorum. Um, any objections? Hearing none, so moved. Passed as amended. Okay. Thanks for the uh, detail, Lucia. All right, I've got a few more things there, uh, and they are landmark fee waivers and signs. So bear with me. We have five landmark fee waivers. I'll read them all together and take a motion all at the end. In the first ward, located at 1441 North Milwaukee Avenue. In the second ward, located at 2146 West Pierce Avenue. In the ninth ward, located at 11345 South Forestville Avenue. In the 39th ward, located at 5801 North Pulaski Road. And lastly, in the 43rd Ward, located at 560 West Fullerton. Any questions by committee members? Can I get a motion to move due pass by the same roll call that was used to determine quorum? So moved by Alderman David Moore. Alderman David Moore moves due pass on the items. Any objections? Hearing none, the items are passed. Lastly, we have large signs over 100 square feet in area, 24 feet above grade. We will hear them all together. I will read the ward followed by the address and take a motion at the end. Starting in the 14th ward, one sign at 4343 South Pulaski Road. Also in the 14th ward, four signs located at 4000 West 40th Street. In the 14th ward again, two signs located at 3507 West 51st Street. Moving on to the 20th ward, 1138 West 48th Street. Also in the 20th Ward, two signs located at 1129 West 47th Street. Moving on to the 28th Ward, three signs located at 1520 West Harrison Street. In the 44th Ward, 2902 North Clark Street. Also in the 44th Ward, 3700 North Clark Street. And lastly, in the 47th Ward, 3407 North Polina Street. If there are no questions by committee members, do I hear a motion move due pass by the same roll call that was used to determine quorum? So move. Alderman Beal uh, moves due pass. Any objections to that motion? Hearing none, the items are passed. And uh, thank you for your patience. That concludes today's meeting. Can I get a motion to adjourn? So moved, oh, Rodriguez. Alderman Rodriguez uh, makes that motion to adjourn. Any objections? Hearing none, the meeting is adjourned.